my my son-in-law hasn't been very well. He's double jabbed, but yeah, yeah he's, he's had. I had sore throat all last week. Actually, I thought I had it, but um.
members, please, could I remind you, lovely members, could I remind you that uh, even if you have been to a committee meeting in the hall recently, please could you give your card to Rebecca so that she can register it against your microphone? That would be great. Thank you. Also, we want to do uh, a practice vote, um, which when we've got cards registered, I think we'll do just to check that everything is lined up with the right microphones and that everything's happening as it should. So if you could bring your card to Rebecca, if you haven't already done so, that would be most helpful. Thank you. Members, could I uh, ask that we conduct a practice vote and I'm going to let Rebecca run through that with you. Shall I propose a motion? <laughs> well, members, we're just going to do the practice vote, so I'm just going to press start on that. So in accordance with the instructions that Erin is handing out, if you see the blue icon on your microphone light up, if you touch that first, it will then show you the for, against and abstain buttons. Okay. Four is green, red is against, and yellow is abstain. Can I clarify that when you have registered your vote, the button shows your, the way that you voted. In other words, if you voted for, it shows your button as green, and then the others go gray, and then it reverts to the total. Members, could we just try that again, please? We're just going to try another practice vote. So remember, you need to register by pressing the blue button to indicate that you want to vote. So first of all, press the blue button. That will show up the green, red, and yellow buttons. And if you want to vote for, you press the green. If you want to vote against, you press the red. And if you want to abstain, you press yellow. Is everybody being able to register? No, Councillor Bygot.
Aaron, could you check with Councillor Bygot? He he was unable to vote earlier. He's just here. Members, I've been asked to, to run that one more time, please. So. Can we stop that vote and try again? Would you like me to try again, Rebecca? Everyone, sorry. Hands up if you've not been able to vote for me. Just so I know we have an issue. Should we stop that vote? Yeah. 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 So can we stop the last one? Can we stop the last one and run another one? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Can I just um, say to the people who are patiently waiting online to take part, um, we're just checking that all of the cards for members who are present in the chamber are registered correctly and that they're able to vote. So please bear with us while we just check that technical issue. And I'm sorry that causes a slight delay. Please bear with us.
So members, we'd just like to one, run one more test vote, please. Uh, could I just ask you to uh, vote when it comes up on your screen? So blue to register that you're present. And, and then whichever green, red, or green for four, red for against, and yellow for abstain. Thank you. Just one, I think, that's... Is, is that okay, Sarah? Yeah. Could I just ask any members, if you have the Teams meeting up on your laptop, please could you make sure that you are muted and speakers off? So that's the on-off button at the top right, top left of these screens anyway. Thank you. Good afternoon, members. Uh, thank you very much. I apologize for the delay uh, when we started. We're just making sure that the vote could be held properly. So thank you for your patience. Could I also say at the outset, if any of the gentlemen would like to, or indeed any of the ladies would like to take their jacket off, you're most welcome to as it's quite warm. So whether you are attending virtually uh, can I just welcome you to the meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council on Thursday the 22nd of July at 2 p.m. Thank you for attending. Uh, whether you're attending virtually or in person, welcome to this meeting of the South Cambridgeshire District Council. This is the first full meeting of the council in the council chamber for approximately 15 months. My name is Councillor Anna Bradnam and I am the chair of South Cambridgeshire District Council. My vice chair is Councillor Peter Fane. Peter Fane. May I may now I sorry may I now make some housekeeping arrangements, uh, including important safety information for those present in person. So, if you're attending the meeting in person, please ensure that you wear a face covering at all times where possible. And I'm afraid I'm the only exception to that uh, at the moment. To explain, for the benefit of those members who have attended committee meetings and who will not have been asked to keep their masks on throughout the meeting, even whilst seated, the reason is that, unlike for those committee meetings, there are a greater number of people present. Thus, we are closer together, and, and that's why we'd like you to continue to wear your masks, if you would. Please also keep to the one-way system for entering and exiting the chamber. Please use the hand sanitizer provided and the sanitizing wipes before and after sitting at your tables. Whether present in the chamber or virtually present, please make sure that you do not switch your microphone on unless you've been invited to speak. Those who are participating virtually 
should, if possible, use a microphone and should speak slowly and clearly. Please ensure that you switched off or silenced any other devices you may have so that they don't interrupt our proceedings. Only those members present in the chamber will be able to move and second motions and vote. Members present virtually, however, may speak in the debate. Please would members who are attending virtually indicate a wish to speak by use of chat in the Teams meeting. Those present in the council chamber should indicate their wish to speak by raising their hand. I'll ask my vice chair to keep a note of the order of speakers both virtually and in the room. And I'm mindful that we want to include the people who are taking part virtually just as much as the people who are in the room. When we move to a vote on any item and there is not clear affirmation, I will state that a recorded vote is to be taken. Members in the chamber will then vote electronically, selecting for, against, or abstain, as we've just demonstrated, and the result will be displayed. Those present, including any members of the public observing, or any public speakers, are asked to note that this meeting is being filmed and live streamed. By your presence, you're deemed to have consented to be filmed and to the use of those images and sound recordings for a webcast. May I remind members that when speaking, they should not disclose any personal information of any individual, as this might infringe, infringe the rights of that individual and breach the Data Protection Act. Finally, may I remind members that you are required to address the meeting through the chair, please. Officers have confirmed that this meeting is court and we can proceed. One further thing, as our microphones are on tables and standing to speak means projecting the voice more, which is less safe for us, in the interests of both safety and practicality, I propose that standing order 21.2, standing to speak, be suspended for the duration of the meeting. Do I, ha I think Councillor Fain is happy to second that. Thank you, Councillor Fain. Uh, members, does anyone wish to vote against that motion? That's great. Thank you. Any, I'm sure nobody online would mind. Thank you. So uh, the council therefore agrees by this motion by affirmation. Thank you very much. First, so first item on the agenda on our yes. Of Sorry, Madam Chairman, but I would prefer not to wear a mask this afternoon. Um, I've had to go on a much stronger inhaler because I've been very unwell with my asthma for the last three weeks. I will promise not to ki kiss Richard too often and or touch him. Um, well, try not to anyway. And um, I'm just wondering if that is okay with you. Unless Councillor Williams... Councillor Roberts, that's... Uh, if, if Councillor Williams is happy with that, I'm, I'm happy with that. Especially not kissing me, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much. And I do understand your reasons, Councillor Roberts. So, moving on. Item one on our page, little one. Um, apologies. Are there any apologies for absence? Sorry. Can I also point out that I'm going to endeavour to keep this meeting, given the proximity that we're all sitting in, I'm going to try and keep this meeting as short as possible. So, are there any apologies for absence, please? Uh, I think Patrick uh, Adams uh, will be advising us about the apologies for absence. Apologies, Chair. Yes, apologies for, for not telling you the apologies quicker. Uh, we've got <laughs> apologies from Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, Sarah Chung Johnson, Gavin Clayton, Joe Hales, Bill Hanley, Steve Hunt, Dawn Percival, and Nick Sample. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much indeed. Do you have all those? I had, did you have Gavin Clayton? Okay, thank you. Yes, did I not read out Gavin Clayton? If I didn't, I, I apologise. I can go through the names again if you like. Do any other members here in the hall have any other uh, apologies for absence? I can't see any. Okay, thank you. So, declarations of interest, members. Do any members have any interest to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda? If an interest subsequently becomes apparent later on in the meeting, please would you raise it at that point? But do any have any declarations now? 
from the no register of interests then item three please may i remind members that they need to keep their register of interests up to date and that they should inform democratic services of any changes so to the minutes members oh uh, i have a note Um, we're going to take each set of minutes in turn. Members are asked to approve the accuracy of the minutes of the previous meetings of Council held on the 15th of April, the 4th of May and the 20th of May. And I'm going to take each set in turn. So taking the first minutes, first set of minutes for the meeting held on the 15th of April. Does it, uh, thank you. Um, I have a number of items, so I can see Councillor Howell, we've had Councillor Ruth Betson on chat and Councillor Bhattacharya. So uh, Chairman, I will take Councillor Howell first. Chairman, I need to say that um, Councillor Ruth Betson needs to speak on the minutes. That's okay, all that's fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Bhattacharya? You, which meeting was that? On the 15th of April? So. We understand that Councillor Bhattacharya attended on the 15th of April, but her name does not appear as an attendee. Could we check that? Thank you. Is that all right, Patrick? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I've made a note of that. Thank you very much. Uh, and Councillor Betson. Thank you, Chairman. My comment is, as Councillor Bhattacharya, I was present on the on Thursday to the 15th of April. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Betson. So can I clarify then what you were saying was that it was you who were not present, uh, not marked as present on the 15th of April, not Councillor Bhattacharya? No, both of us were ah, present. Both of you. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. So both were marked as not present and they were present on the 15th of April. With that amendment, uh, can I ask that we uh, approve those minutes? Um, we have, I believe we have a proposer for the minutes, Councillor Goff, and a seconder, Councillor Henry Batchelor. Thank you very much. Does anybody wish to abstain or object? Good. Okay, so with that approval, as amended, uh, we can say that they're a correct record by affirmation. Thank you. Taking the next set of minutes for the meeting held on the 4th of May. Members, are we able to approve the minutes by affirmation? Are there agreed? Lovely. Thank you very much. Are there any, is there anybody online who has any concerns? No, good. Okay. So the chair, the council therefore agrees the approval of the minutes uh, as they are, as a correct record by affirmation. Thank you very much. And finally, taking the minutes of the meeting held on the 20th of May. Members, are we able to approve these minutes by affirmation? Oh, uh, I can see that Councillor Heather Williams would like to speak. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's just that on my personal explanation, it's referred to in association with the MP, but it wasn't the Mayor. We could take the page number, please, I'm Councillor. I'm trying to find it, Chairman. Oh. You're ready to send me one, uh, It's page 38. Um, so it should be that the reference made to the mayor, the former mayor, not MP. Um, this is four bullet point, the four paragraphs up from the bottom of item 26. Is that right? Yeah. So it currently says, Councillor Heather Williams said as a point of information that the reference made to the MP suggested he had supported the station north of Camborne, etc. But you're saying it should have been the mayor? Yes. Lovely. Thank you very much. Patrick, have, do you have that record of that amendment? Yes, Chair. I've, I've, made, I've got a record of that and I'll make that amendment uh, soon after the meeting. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Councillor Williams. So with that amendment, are members happy that we record that as a correct record as amended by affirmation. Lovely, thank you very much indeed. Right, uh, so we come to item five, announcements. Um, 
I'll invite announcements from um, the, the leader, who I'm, I believe is taking part online, the executive and the head of paid service. And I will commence with my own amend, uh, announcement, which is that uh, I would like to announce that my charity, my chair's charity for this year, I've, I've been very concerned about the impact of the pandemic on young people both in school and uh, those who are starting to consider work. And uh, I would like to support them as much as we as a council can by uh, announcing that my chair's charity will be Centre 33. This is a charity that supports young people in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough and has offices in Cambridge and from which it services South Cams. And they, cover, they support young people with a wide range of issues. They specialise in enabling young people to help themselves through guidance and advice and talking through and working alongside them. Uh, they give practical help and uh, emotional support. They give very practical advice and guidance and signposting about housing. They will pick up needs to do with support for food. Uh, they cover as issues to do with sexual health and well-being uh, and mental health. And they also offer counselling in schools. And uh, so I think they offer a wide range of support, which is always extremely practical. And I hope you as members can support me in that choice of charity. Thank you. So that is Centre 33. Chief Executive, do we have any announcements? No, thank you, sir. Thank you. And I, the leader, did you have any announcements? Uh, no, I don't have any announcements, but I'd just like to commend your choice of charity, uh, Centre 33, do incredible work, and um, I think it's an excellent, excellent one to select. Thank you. Thank you very much, leader. So, um, we move on to item six, questions from the public. Okay, thank you. Sorry. So we have an update. Uh, as you appreciate from our agenda, we originally had a question from uh, Mr. Daniel Fulton. Unfortunately, he's unable to join us, uh, and e either in present or remotely. Uh, so I propose to read his question and allow the, the uh, lead member to respond. So Mr. Fulton's question was, in order to meet the government's housing targets, this council is set to approve 11,000 new dwellings at Water Beach Newtown, 10,000 dwellings at North Stow, and 3,500 dwellings at Bourne Airfield. The chalk aquifer that feeds the River Cam and its tributaries is already over-abstracted, and this council's plan is to continue to abstract all water from that aquifer to serve these additional 24,500 dwellings. The council's role as local planning authority is to ensure that these developments are acceptable in planning terms. How is allowing the development of 24,500 dwellings with no sustainable water supply consistent with this council's promise to be, quote, green to the core? And I believe the lead cabinet member for planning it will respond. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. If it's okay with you, can I take this off whilst I'm speaking? Certainly, yes, thank please you. do. Uh, the developments at Water Beach, North Stowe and Bourne form a central part of the 2018 local plan. 
Uh, the local plan was subject to rigorous scrutiny, which included an extended examination process from 2014 when it was submitted to the planning inspectorate to 2018 when it was found sound following modifications. The planning authority consulted the environment agency throughout the local plan process and also agreed a statement of common ground supporting the climate change and water conservation policies in that plan. The Environment Agency did not object to the allocation of the new settlements outlined in the plan. Subsequent to the adoption of the local plan, this council consulted the Environment Agency on the supplementary planning guidance developed for both Water Beach and Bourne that were adopted in 2019. They did not object to the SPDs. We consult with the Environment Agency as part of the planning application processes for all three settlements mentioned. The Environment Agency are the statutory regulatory authority responsible for managing the quality of the water environment and issuing permits for allowing water abstraction in this area. They recognize that further sources of new supply will be required to accommodate growth across Cambridgeshire. NOSTO is included within the Water Resources Management Plan for the area, and so far they have not objected to the current applications, nor suggested that plan development across the district should stop. I should make it clear that the proposals for Nosto, Bourne, and Water Beach will not result in all 24,000 homes being built immediately. The current housing trajectory forecasts about 6,135 new homes being built across all three sites by 2031. As part of the process of creating the new local plan, the council commissioned evidence on the issue of water supply and have raised the evidence with the agencies, including Water Resources East, Environment Agency, Cambridge Water, and the MHCLG Oxcam team. We have highlighted to these agencies the conclusions of that evidence requiring a reduced dependency on the aquifer to supply greater Cambridge's water need in the future. The council has been advised that solutions to water supply are possible and expect to continue to press those agencies to bring forward early solutions to resolve the issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Dr. Hawkins. Moving on to petitions, item seven. We have no petitions. Uh, so we move on to item eight. Uh, this is the report from the Civic Affairs Committee on the 10th of June, the Babraham and Sawston Community Governance Review, which is on pages 41 to 56 of our agendas. May I call upon the Head of Transformation uh, to present the report on the recommendation of the Civic Affairs Committee as stated in the papers, and um, we have uh, the Head of Transformation on our screens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Uh, the report before you gives all of the details of this community governance review, so I should just highlight some of the salient points for you. The review was triggered because new residential developments that span the current boundary of Sawston and Babraham are likely to make that current boundary impractical going forward. Both parish councils proactively recognised the likely impact of these developments and reached a memorandum of understanding on how future Section 106 monies would be allocated. Sawston Parish Council also made an application to this council for a community governance review to consider a boundary change between the two parishes, proposing a new line that was acceptable to both. An initial consultation was therefore undertaken on these proposals and also asked if there were any alternative suggestions for a new boundary. 75 residents responded to the initial consultation and of these 64 agreed that the existing boundaries should be changed and 11 suggested that it should not. Three alternative boundary changes were proposed but two were broadly similar to that proposed by Sawston Parish Council, and the one that wasn't was not supported by current guidance on boundary setting. Stage two consultation therefore only uh, considered the boundary change proposed by Sawston Parish Council. 
Here, 48 residents responded to the consultation. 41 agreed with the proposed boundary change and seven did not. That's an 85% agreeing. The approach to both stages of the consultation had been agreed by Civic Affairs Committee. Following the results of the second consultation, the recommendations uh, being put before you today were drafted by officers and then adopted by Civic Affairs Committee. We think they represent a sensible and practical way forward. The recommendations are that A, a new parish boundary between Sawston and Babraham uh, be adopted, and that's as proposed in Appendix A of the report before you, and was the one proposed by Sawston Parish Council. And B, a formal request be made to the Local Government Boundary Commission for England to realign the District Council ward boundaries between Duxford and Sawston wards to ensure that they remain aligned with the new parish uh, council boundaries. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Membry, uh, as our Head of Transformation. And as Chair of Civic Affairs, um, having only seen this through at the very latest stages, I'd like to thank the officers for the work they have done on this, and I propose this report. Uh, I, may I call for a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Milnes, uh, who is the local member for Sawston. Thank you. So would anybody like to ask any questions? I think, uh, would you like to reserve your right to speak or would you like to speak now? I would now? like to speak, but unless anybody else would yeah, do want to, Chair. So I'd just like to recommend um, this proposal to the Council as a, a local member, along with um, Councillor Belderfield. Uh, we're very much in support of this. Sorry, did you want to interrupt? No, I was just registering to speak. It was loud. It's loud. It's a, uh, so, thank you. So, so it was just Councillor Heather Williams who was registering her wish to speak at a later point. Do carry on, Councillor Mills. Sorry about the confusion. Where was I? Oh, yes. Well, we were, <laughs> I was speaking in support of this and, and uh, wanted to uh, thank the officers involved, Dave Clark and his team, uh, and Louise Lord, and then Andy Francis, who was dealing with the, the wider uh, issues that have just been mentioned. Um, it does indeed represent an anomalous uh, uh, situation <laughs> with uh, boundary lines going over uh, new housing estates, and it's a very straightforward um, remedy for that anomalous situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Mills. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. If if that's permissible by Councillor Mills, um, so it's permissible uh, by me. Thank so you. yes, um, I was only going to say that um, just recognise the work of the officers in this and uh, serving members of Civic Affairs, past and, and present. Obviously, Douglas and Lacey. Um, did an awful lot of work on this while we were on civic affairs together. Um, and uh, I think it's one of the times when we've all been in agreement. Not always found, Chairman, but uh, very happy when it is. So fully supportive. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to make any comments about this? I can't see any. I don't see any sure. being there. We, uh, thank you. So are you happy then, members, to take this decision by affirmation? Uh, and the recommendations were as... Uh, Jeff Membry read out. Agreed? That's great. Thank you. Are there any uh, objections and any abstentions? None. Thank you. We'll, the Council therefore agrees the motion by affirmation. Thank you. Moving on to item nine. This is the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Combined Authority. Um, we're looking at pages 57 to 82 on our agenda. This item is for update, and I invite the leader to update the council uh, on this report from the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Combined Authority. Thank you, leader. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Chair. Um, so from sunny Devon, um, my family are all on the beach. I'm here. Um, just to give you a very quick update. Um, Councillor Wayne Fitzgerald has been um, given the position of statutory deputy mayor. 
Um, there's been some debate about a non-statutory deputy role as well, which is as yet uh, not agreed. Um, at the last board meeting, uh, some of us were not very happy about the response from the combined authority to the east-west rail consultation. Uh, and it, as a result of that, they have very, very much strengthened the response. So it aligns far better with both this council's response and also the county council's response. Um, you'll see in the papers that there is obviously a commitment to bus-based solutions and uh, work is ongoing, I think, at some speed on a bus service improvement plan, and that will include franchising. There's been some um, chit-chat that franchising was off the table, but uh, I've had confirmation from uh, officers that it's still very much on the table. Uh, we've had a letter recently saying that the Cambridge and Peterborough Combined Authority has passed its five-year gateway review, which means that a further £100 million worth of funding will be made available over the next five years, and that comes in in £20 million tranches. Uh, there are new co-opted members uh, on, on the board, uh, police and crime, new police and crime commissioner, new representative from the Cambridge and Peterborough Fire Authority, and a representative from the Cambridge and Peterborough Clinical Commissioning Group. Uh, the other big bit of news is that there is a new chief executive officer uh, being employed, Eileen Milner, who's actually a resident of South Cambridgeshire, which is nice. Um, and she will be starting in the, in the autumn. So uh, she's, um, she's a person of uh, considerable repute, if you like to uh, Google her. And then the last bit from me is that I'm very pleased that the Combined Authority Board agreed, albeit not unanimously, to, um, uh, to accept all of the recommendations from the Tri Climate Change Commission and have committed £50,000 for the development of a set of final recommendations from this, uh, this group of eminent, eminent people. Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Leader. Um, does anybody have any questions for the Leader? I can't see any. Does anybody else wish to speak? Okay. Okay. Councillor Wright, you go ahead. Thank you. Uh, quick chance for the Leader to make that clear. It's a it's a little bit muffled on this side. And did she say the new chief executive was a lady of ill repute? <laughs> some repute. You are very naughty, Councillor Wright, of some repute. <laughs> Certainly, that, that's what I heard in the chamber. Thank you, Leader. Thank you. So, uh, members, we've had our opportunity for questions and representations. Uh, will our representatives on the combined authority wish to speak? Councillor Van der Leyen. Uh, yes, thank you very much indeed. Yes, so I've recently become uh, one of the councillors. Just a moment, Councillor. Could you take your mask off for Certainly, this yes. purpose? Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I have recently become one of this council's representatives on the combined authority's overview and scrutiny committee, uh, along with Councillor Ripith. Um, I was very pleased to discover uh, that one of the, the, the very first thing we had to do uh, was consider the recommendations from a review of scrutiny by the Centre for Scrutiny and Governance. Um, uh, and the main suggestion uh, largely echoes what is happening at our own scrutiny committee following a, a, a similar review, uh, that is moving away from examining the agenda papers of the board immediately before the board uh, takes place um, and con conducting more focused uh, and in-depth scrutiny um, as early as possible in the process of, of formation of, of policy, um, which I think would be extremely beneficial. Uh, I would uh, like to thank our previous representatives, Councillors Chamberlain and Councillor and Councillor Fain, uh, for, for their serving on the scrutiny committee before us, and in particular for helping to instigate this review. Thank you very much, Councillor van der Leyen. Moving on to item 10, uh, we've got the Greater Cambridge Partnership Executive Board uh, whose papers are on pages 83 to 86. Again, this is an update, and I invite the deputy leader to update the council on this report. Councillor Goff. Thank you, Chair. Um, as this refers to the last um, round of... Councillor Goff, could you move your microphone slightly closer to you? Thank you. Okay, um, is that better? Um, so so uh, this refers to the last round of um, 
board and joint assembly uh, meetings, which a number of members were actually engaged in the assembly. Um, these were uh, important uh, round of decisions insofar as the four key transportation schemes were, um, were progressed, each of them to the next stage as detailed in the, in the papers. Um, just a couple of things I would just draw out for members on the individual items. Uh, on the Water Beach scheme, uh, the board agreed um, to focus on the western and central op options and not to pursue the eastern option as a result of input from the public consultation. Uh, on the Camborne to Cambridge scheme, where we reviewed the independent audit, uh, the independent auditor concluded that there was no reason to delay initiating moving to the environmental audit uh, stage. However, the environmental, the independent auditor uh, did highlight several areas where further work was required to address gaps in the scheme, uh, including interaction with East-West Rail, uh, the national bus strategy, and the onward travel issues uh, in Cambridge as captured under what is known as the city access. Um, this was taken on board by the board uh, and will be a key item on the September agenda. That's the item relating to the city access and agreed on the joint assembly agenda. Uh, the CSET scheme passed a further milestone whereby the board approved the preparation of a Transport Works Act order to secure, to seek to secure planning consent for the scheme. Uh, in the process of that, the board carefully reviewed alternative pro proposals that had been advanced and concluded that the preferred scheme met both the strategic objective as contained in the local transport plan and was at an appropriate stage to progress. It is also uh, noteworthy for this council that uh, the meeting was joined uh, and we welcomed Mayor Nick Joint Johnson to the meeting. He joined the first part of the meeting um, and he clearly signaled his desire to work with the GCP, which of course the last mayor did as well. Um, and we'll see what uh, happens with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mayor Johnson. But um, it was a very good intervention from him. And um, one thing that particularly is worth noting was that while he made clear that the decisions on the routing of any scheme was a matter for the GCP board, uh, he, he clearly endorsed the concept of busways as the strategic solution to the transportation issues in the Greater Cambridge Partnership. So that was um, uh, a most welcome statement from him. Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. I have uh, a question for you, um, Councillor Gulf, or perhaps just an observation. And that is, um, I note that the central route that the Executive Board is taking forward on the Water Beach to Cambridge uh, route is not the same as the central route that was consulted upon as part of the major public consultation. Uh, it differs in a significant manner and that has caused considerable um, upset and concern for the residents of Land Beach. Um, and I would just like to make that point that it has caused considerable concern for residents who feel they may be impacted. Okay, well, this is the, you know, goes forward to the next stage, so we will take that on board, and I'll pass that as comments on. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Williams, Councillor Heather Williams, to go ahead. Thank you, Chairman, and, and through myself as, a, as an Assembly member, um, just on the point that you mentioned, I think it's important to note that it wasn't the unanimous support from the Assembly in relation to that. I personally seek to have a, a re-consultation on the changes that were made. Um, but there wasn't a majority for it. Um, I'd also say that it was referred to, Chairman, that this is a report from the Board and the Assembly, but actually there's only feedback from the Assembly, page 84.8. Um, if we want this to be a joint Assembly Board report in future, then it may be helpful to put the minutes of the Assembly meeting in it, as well as the minutes of the Board meeting, um, because on some issues, such as CSET, for example, there has not been uniformity from the members of this Council. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you. My observation is that it is, it's, it's um, reported as a report of the Executive Board. Yes, Chairman, but 
the lead cabinet member said it's a report from the board and assembly. That may have been a mistake, but if it is, I think there needs to be a little more in the assembly. May I just clarify? Um, if I, it, that was a slip of the tongue. I was just trying to make reference to the work of the assembly, in particular the members who are involved in this assembly, in the joint assembly, as input to the board. Uh, sorry if I construed it as a report from the joint assembly. So for clarity, this is a report from the board. Were there any other questions for Councillor Goff? No, thank you. Good. Uh, so the next item is item 11, which is the an update on the Oxford Cambridge Arc. Uh, our report is item 11 on page 87 to 88. And I invite the leader to update the council on this report, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I'll sit a bit nearer so hopefully you can hear me. Uh, so things are beginning to happen in relation to the Oxford Cambridge Arc. Uh, we've had sort of three years of talking about things, but now we are getting uh, formal announcements from government. So this week has seen the launch of a 12-week consultation on an arc-wide spatial framework. So that means, um, so that's a, a plan that will take us up to 2050. Uh, the, um, if we, the arc itself consists of a vast area stretching obviously, obviously from Oxford to Cambridgeshire, two counties, Oxford and Cambridgeshire, eight unitaries, ten districts and one combined authority. Uh, so the uh, narrative that's coming out of government is that the plan aims to enhance the infrastructure across the arc, enhance the environment, and also identify the scope for new developments. Now, related to that, uh, yesterday was the announcement of the establishment of an expert panel, which will be chaired by Emma Carriaja. And this will be concentrating initially on what the scope is for uh, new developments uh, on our side of the, bed near the Bedfordshire to Cambridgeshire end of the arc. So I believe there are other people already uh, in line to take part in that expert panel, uh, but they haven't been able to move it forward quickly enough to actually uh, go public on what the names were. Uh, so um, what we're also expecting in the next few days is an announcement about an ARC growth body. Now, we are told that this ARC, ARC growth body will unlock the full potential of the ARC and will improve the social, economic, and environmental outcomes of the arc. These are the, these are government's work, words. Um, we, it will um, help to formulate the long-term vision uh, for, for, uh, for the arc as a whole. And this is about sustainability and prosperity of communities, uh, supporting the terrible word, the internationalization of the arc, support innovation, and again, improve environmental outcomes. I suppose it is a sort of equivalent to uh, the Northern Powerhouse and the Midlands Ed Engine. And we're told that it will be working along with the four growth boards currently in existence along the arc. And again, leading on the economic strategy on the delivery of net zero, driving private and uh, international investment and delivering on the arc priorities. So from my point of view, uh, what I am pleased about in this 12-week consultation is that the environment really is front and centre. So we fought as a leaders group very, very hard to get government to appreciate that we had to be able to say to people that there's something in it for the people already living in the ark. And the opportunity is about the enhancement of the environment about doubling nature, you know, picking up on our own, our own priorities. But this is a government project. Uh, it's a government scheme. And even though they say they want to work very closely with uh, all the uh, local administrations within the ARC and with other stakeholders and our residents, you know, it's vital that we hold them to account. So I would encourage all of you to participate in the consultation and to encourage uh, your parish council to do likewise because this is really setting the direction for our area for the next, um, next 30, 30 years. So, you know, there's, there's information appearing online now, 
Uh, you know, we still don't have an Oxford Cambridge art website because government haven't been uh, ready to deliver that. And the only other thing I wanted to say is that the lead minister, Chris Pincher, who leads at MHCLG, has now publicly said that the ARC is not about a million new homes. It's actually about economic growth. So happy to answer any questions that I can. And uh, Liz Watts participates in the, uh, uh, the executive uh, boards there as well. So she can probably fill in any gaps that I can't. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lida. Uh, and we have questions um, in the room, certainly first from Councillor Deborah Roberts. Um, no, it's not, really a, it's not really a question to the leader. Um, and I appreciate that she's basically read out what is their vision. Um, and it's not necessarily uh, Bridget's vision, I hope. I hope to God it's not. Um, because quite honestly, uh, it's time we started um, standing up to this. Um, it may be a government um, idea, um, but the pretense um, is extraordinary. The pretense and the thought that we are going along with believing it, that this is all about improving quality of life for our residents and greening up the world and being terribly lovely and woke, etc., is just ridiculous. This is an idea conceived and now being festered in hell. It will cover South Cambridgeshire. They talk, that's what they are emphasizing, that it's a tremendous opportunity for growth. God's sake, we don't need that much more growth. What we are having to take on board already is destroying the quality of life for South Cambridgeshire residents. Villages are practically joining up now. There's hardly a, a hair's breadth between villages. And the thought that some unnecessary joining up of Oxford and Cambridge um, is, is anything genuine. Um, other, it's, it's about development. It's about all these firms who want to step in and continue growing and growing here. This is not what we should be doing in this country. The South is well overloaded already. There's no need for this extra growth to maintain the viability of this area. This area is viable as it is. It does not need all this. It should be, and the government do need, and I'm really disappointed as a northerner, that having heard Boris say that he was going to sort out and get improvements for the north and make them as wealthy as the south, that they're still coming along with this sort of shenanigans, jiggery pokery it's absolutely ridiculous and it's time that we as a council stood up to this you do not have to go along with government whoever they are um you know i i support some of the things this government do i very much against some of the things this government do but this one we should as a council be standing against it it's an absolute atrocious nonsense and really we should stand up and be counted. It's time we did, before everything is lost. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Uh, we have um, Councillor Richard Williams, who wishes to speak. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to ask the leader, um, you, you mentioned the advisory panel um, focusing on the Cambridge Bedford area. Um, could I ask what, what um, conversations have been had about local input into that panel um, and what the leader's done to try and um, ensure that the local voice is heard as part of that panel and not merely from the outside shouting at it. Thank you. Do you want me to, uh, so Chair, would you like me to yes. respond to the, yes. two, the two speakers now? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. So if I just take Councillor Roberts, first of all. Uh, so the problem, uh, so I absolutely appreciate what you say, Councillor Roberts, and, but when you say, you know, we must stand up to this, the problem has been that we haven't known what this is in order to stand up to, to it. So, you know, we could have done what Buckinghamshire Council did, and that's just opt out. But the problem is you can't physically opt out of a geographic area. And, you know, all that's happened with Buckinghamshire is that they've lost their voice at the table. So, you know, we... We, we cannot define you know, what, what the arc is at the moment in order to know what battles we need to be fighting. 
So they are, you know, government are, and far be it from me to defend, a, you know, government scheme here, but they are making the right noises about listening to us and engaging with us and this being shaped by the sort of, by a, a bottom-up approach. So, you know, we need to, we need to get on board with this 12-week consultation. And then if what we and our residents and our local businesses are saying does not translate into what this plan is, then we will be standing up to this and fighting it and, and objecting, objecting to it. Because, you know, if government are listening to us, and if we are saying, actually, we don't, there's stuff we don't want here, we also have to say what we do want. You know, it's not good enough just to say we don't want something. Uh, you know, we've got, there's an, there are opportunities in the off. There's opportunities for a significant, a significant increase in strategic green infrastructure, for, for instance. And, you know, we need to be pushing, pushing that sort of, sort of stuff. Um, so on, on housing, as I say, the minister has said, there's not going to be, has said there is not going to be any housing over and above what is in our current, uh, in our, in our local plans at the time. You know, I have no reason as we stand at the moment, not to not to believe that, because that's what's been said. But we have to hold them hold them to account. Um, so, but it's also there is also potential here for levelling up. So I was this morning in a meeting of the local government association, where we're trying to sort of understand what's actually meant by levelling up. And we know that across, you know, within Cambridgeshire, there are some serious inequalities. You know, we have people who you know, living elsewhere in the county who don't live as long as we live in South Cambridgeshire, don't get the same um, access to healthcare, don't get the same educational opportunities. You know, this, is an, this I, I hope, presents an opportunity for us to address some of the inequalities in our own backyard, as well as some of the inequalities across the wider region. But, as I, as I say, you know, if this looks like a load of rubbish at the end, then yes, we will be standing up and objecting to it and shouting loudly. Um, now, in relation to uh, Councillor Williams' uh, question about the advisory panel, well, Councillor Williams, um, uh, 10 days ago, I hadn't heard about an advisory panel. This was news to me. Um, say 10 days ago, I heard that there was going to be one. Then a few days later, I heard that there was going to be no announcement on it until after uh, recess. And then lo and behold, this week, yesterday, I think, suddenly there's an announcement about it. So, you know, I've had no engagement. I'm not aware that any other council leader has actually had any, um, any engagement with government over this advisory panel. It was just, just announced. Um, I don't know if our chief executive um, can add anything to that. Would you like to speak? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, we, we have had an early uh, early advance of the advisory panel probably about four or five days ago from MHCLG, and they have indicated that they would like uh, t t us, you know, the, the leader of the administration, to have early conversations with uh, um, Emma um, and to be involved in the work of the advisory panel. So uh, that's, that's the only information that I have at the moment, and that's from a civil servant at MHCLG. Thank you very much, Chief Executive. I believe we have a question from Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. And as the leader will be aware, the, this standing item on our full council came from a group leaders meeting where I raised the Oxcam Arc. Um, and I have to say, Chairman, that I'm, I'm disappointed in the report, which there are less paragraphs in this than there were pages for the combined authority report. Most of it is about the meetings and just says what meetings have been had. There's nothing in here, Chairman, that we actually know what the leader is saying or indeed what therefore what this council is saying. We don't know what this council or the, the leader is wanting from the ARC. So when, it's, when she says, or the leader says, doesn't say what we are saying and want, you know, sort, the sort of stuff like strategic infrastructure, I'm not getting anything material to know what it is that is being had and has been spoken about over the last three years. I'd also say that there's some mix, mixture in that at a previous meeting, we were told anything to do, you know, it's 
we, we don't have that sort of influence. It's a government project. Yet at Scrutiny on Tuesday, we heard that we've got significant influence in this, that, and the other. So I'm, I'm struggling to know which is it. Do we not have any influence? In which case, why are we not? Or are we not saying anything? Or is the leader saying things but just not informing the council? And I would therefore raise 5.2 paragraph subsection D, Chairman of the Constitution, which says, ensure the council is a forum of debate where members who do not serve on the cabinet may hold the cabinet to account. Chairman, how can we do that if we don't know what the leader is saying? Thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, leader, would you like to respond? Uh, well, I'm just trying to think how, how to respond, because as I say, this is, you know, these are non-statutory meetings of, um, well, I mean, there's a plenary meeting tomorrow, which is all the leaders um, across the arc, and these are led by, um, you know, by civil servants, really, and we are, they are, they are debate meetings. Um, I don't think you've got enough time for me to kind of reiterate it. The, you know, the whole of these debates. This is, these are negotiations between council leaders. And actually, you know, they are, they're obviously cross-party negotiations. And actually, they are very, you know, everybody's kind of in the same place about wanting what's best for their communities. So, you know, there's no, there's no big secrets here. We've been trying to flesh out what government wants um, and find, you know, and, and assure ourselves that as uh, council leaders, we have we have influence. Assure ourselves that our residents' voices will be heard, and so this has been a work in progress to get us to the point we're at now, at which the government has launched its consultation, which has been very very much shaped by all these meetings over the last three years. You know, if those meetings hadn't taken place, this would be a very very different sort of consultation. It'd be very it would be government telling you what you're getting, quite honestly. Um, but the reason it is uh, as it is, with the environment featuring very, very large, is because the council leaders have been telling the civil servants and telling the ministers that this is what matters to our residents. So, you know, these, these aren't decision-making meetings. These are debating meetings where stuff is influenced to make sure that when it gets to the point at which uh, we can start writing a formal uh, a formal response as a whole council that actually you know we there is something in it that we can be we can be positive about thank you leader uh, councillor williams did you uh, councillor heather williams would you like to come back thank you chairman i mean again we just get the complete opposites government's going to tell us what we are getting oh but the leaders have had lots of influence and that's why we're getting x is it one is it the other you know, are we pushing for more growth, less growth, more housing, less housing, what projects? And, and Chairman, the part of the Constitution I read is actually responsibilities of the Chairman. So if I may request that you find something that we can hold the leader to account on or ensure that the leader does put something substantial more than just her diary events for a few months. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Did you want back on that leader no there was no question there oh, okay thank you councillor bygot thank you chairman later on in this meeting we're going to be having a debate about being open and transparent does the leader believe that the structure of the oxford cambridgeshire arc so oxford cambridge arc is open and transparent uh well i'll just remind you that it is a government project and um, I don't, you know, I think the government could actually be being far more honest about what their long-term ambition is. Well, no, no, let me rephrase that. You know, we have to trust government that what they have said, what they are saying in this consultation is what they really mean. Um, you know, we have to trust that uh, Chris Pincher, the minister responsible, uh, is speaking the truth when he says, this isn't about a million houses. We have to trust them that they are, when they are saying that the environment is the most important thing. And this is about you know, making sure there are more, more jobs, more high value jobs for our young people. 
So, you know, the responsibility for openness and transparency on the Oxford Cambridge Arc is quite firmly at government's door. Thank you, Nida. And Councillor Wright. Thank you, Chairman. And just going back to this point, Nida, um, what we're trying, you keep saying the government this and the government that. Now, we've had three years of talking about this. What we want to know is what's your vision? What's the council's vision for South Cams out of the East, uh, out of the Oxford Cambridge Arc? You know, it's very simple. What have you been pushing for, for, from South Cams as our vision? What we want out of this scheme? Very simple question. Okay, so so simple. So, apologies, Chair, through you. Uh, so, so simple answer is that as the lead member on the environment, I personally have been pushing for the environment to be front and centre in in the arc. And if the consultation, as published yesterday, is to be believed, that has been achieved. As part of that, I and other leaders. Um, insisted that pressure was put on East West Rail for East West Rail to be electrified. Other than that, you know, the, I, the, the, the response, the vision that will become South Cambridge's vision will come out of the consultation. So we will, you know, we will be encouraging um, our residents, our, you know, the, the stakeholders within South Cambridge to tell us what their vision is, what they want out of this, because our job is to interpret what our residents, our villages, our local businesses want so that we can push for what is best in South Cambridge. It's not about me dictating what I think is best for South Cambridge. You know, we have to start off in listening mode as government have to start off in listening mode so that this, this vision, um, you know, which will uh, hopefully emerge in the next few months, is something that we can all get behind. Because if it isn't, then we will be against it. Thank you, Leader. I believe Councillor Wright would like to come back. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Chairman. It's, I, I'm not sure you've really got what we're asking you here. And this is, you know, this scheme is about growth. It's not about the environment, it's a small fraction of it. You know, right. yeah, it, this scheme is about growth. Um, we want to know what is your vision on growth and this scheme in South Cams. You know, this is a, you know, you can talk about the environment, which is a fraction of the of a scheme, and you know, for goodness sake, it's a diesel railway that's being proposed. You know, and you know, if you're going to major on that, you're going to have trouble selling that as your environmental contribution. What the scheme is about growth along the corridor and into South Cams. When we started talking about this, the last administration, the great attraction to us was that people from Bedford and Milton Keynes could get to their jobs in Cambridge in half an hour, and it would protect us from housing developments in South Cams. A simple, direct route from those big cities in the middle and the English heartlands to open up housing in the places they really need it. Now, those two years, what has been South Cams' vision on growth and the economy from East West Rail and the link. Nida. Thank you very much indeed. So, you know, I have no expectation of us delivering, you know, housing other than what, what is in our local plan. Obviously, we had the announcement in the budget about um, new, new potential for new settlements around the stations associated with East West Rail. And as yet, you know, we hadn't had any clear indication of what that what that actually means you know in fact we don't even know where one of these these new settlements is meant to be they talked about one at cambridge city and you know nobody's getting, giving any indication about that but you know we're not being told at this moment in time that there will be an expectation for taking houses over and above 
what are identified as needed within our new emerging local plan. So I'm certainly not saying to government, come and build houses all over South Cambridgeshire, because, you know, that's not what we, that's not what we're about. It's not what we want. Uh, and that's I'm, I'm glad to hear that from the uh, chief executive is that the expectation from uh, this this newly formed board is that they will start off by listening to us. So, but you know, we have to, as I said before, our vision has to be formed by what our residents and our businesses and our communities are saying saying to us. Thank you, Leader. Um, Councillor Bhattacharya. Sorry, Councillor. Sorry, so I apologise. First, we have Councillor Graham Cohn. You have to go, Graham. Thank you, Chairman. Mine is just a quick one. I just wanted to ask the leader, when will this council be consulting with residents in uh, South Cambridgeshire on the Oxcam market? Uh, so as of, as of now, so we, we are promoting the government's uh, consultation as of now. Thank you. And Councillor Dr Bhattacharya. Could I ask you to bring your microphone close to you and to speak slowly and clearly, Councillor Bhattacharya, so that we can hear you? Okay. Okay, thank you. This is a new system. Uh, thank you that you said that you are actually working for the people, the community, and you do whatever. Councillor Bhattacharya, I apologise for interruption. Could you bring your microphone close to you? And, and speak uh, clearly. Thank you, thank Major. You. you just said that whatever development you were doing or planning, you were doing for the people of South Cambridgeshire. I just heard that. When I remember that a few days back, you um, you even did not actually tell us, bother to tell us, to contact even the Camborne Town Council, the councillors of Camborne, and the people of Camborne about the new development of your plan that is in the, the um, I mean, that is in the business, uh, that plot. So you never bothered to contact us. You never bothered to contact the people of Camborne. You never bothered to contact the town, uh, I mean, uh, our, our existing town council, and you were saying that you are doing whatever you want to do for the people of Camborne or for the people of South Cambridgeshire resident. I just heard that, that's why I mentioned. So it is not always true. So can I clarify, your question was, will, you be, consulting, will you be consulting with the I mean, members just, of South said, Cambridgeshire? Yeah, is that what I your just said the was? statement is not true. The statement heard, is not we, true. Councillor Bhattacharya, thank you. We heard, I'm just clarifying. Thank you. Would you like to answer uh, that? Well, I, I think that was really a, a question, but I mean, you know, we, the, we are promoting the government's consultation on the Oxford Cambridge Arc to all of the communities in South Cambridgeshire. Sorry, I believe Councillor Dr. Richard Williams has a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, it really just follows the question I, I, I made earlier, because I, I maybe didn't push my point for a follow-up. But could I just, via you, maybe via the leader, um, get some help to Chief Executive? Sorry, um, Councillor Richard Williams, please would you slow down? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, could I just seek a bit of clarification from what the Chief Executive sorry. said? Oh. Okay, thank you. I think I'm the only person speaking now. Um, could I just somehow get to the chief executive and just ask her to clarify the point she made in response to me earlier? Was it the case that we've been offered a place on that advisory board or just that we've been offered the opportunity to speak to the chair? Thank you. Sorry, chief executive, would you like to respond to that? Uh, it's certainly not a place on the expert advisory panel. It's an invitation to talk to the panel. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate it's the second time I've spoken on this subject, but I just wanted to pick up something which I don't think the leader may have um, understood clearly, um, is that the questions that have been asked by some of my colleagues over here is, when will the council be consulting, not promoting an external consultation, as in government, but when will the leader the cabinet and this council be asking residents here what they want from it, not just signposting to an external consultation. 
surely we should be asking our residents ourselves. Thank you. Um, do you wish to respond to that? Uh, uh, yeah, so sure. Um, so I mean, I think there's a risk of, du of duplication, but I will take that point away and, con and consider it. So, you know, because, you know, I sit on the leader's board at the combined authority, you know, I, I trust that I will be privy to the results of the government's consultation. And I would hope that that would, uh, that would give us some insight into to what uh, the people and the businesses in different parts of the art want. Um, so, you know, really that I, wish I should have, I'm sure I will have, access to the results of the government's consultation. I am happy, though, Councillor Williams, to uh, go away and have some conversations to see whether you know, there is va value to be added by this council doing something independently itself. So thank you very much for that suggestion. Thank you, Leader. Uh, Councillor Cathcart, I believe you wish to speak. Do feel free to take your mask off when you're speaking, Councillor Cathcart. Thank you. I, mean, I, I think it's already been touched on already, but I, 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 I think I welcome our leaders' involvement in this issue. It's clearly very important, and it does look as if she's got the determination and energy to actually deal with all the salient issues, which I would welcome. Um, I'd just say that there's really an awful lot happening in this district at the moment. We've got our own local plan. We've got the combined authority for planning wrong. We've got the east-west rail. We've got this. And we've got, we've got the combined authority, all of whom have an old involvement in strategic planning matters. There are different timescales involved in all these processes. But I think there's some way has to be found for stitching all this lot together to make sure that actually operate harmoniously, otherwise one is in the danger of very specific whole development scenario operating at slightly different sort of speeds and at slightly different priorities. It's a complex issue to, to try to get this, all these development initiatives to fit together, but I think it's just something to be bearing, to bear in mind if this particular uh, issue has. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So, Chair, like through you. So, thank you, Councillor Cathcart, for your faith in me um, being able to represent this council uh, well on this very significant issue. Uh, so, you're quite right. Our, our communities are under enormous pressure, and we there's probably more happening in South Cambridgeshire than in any other, you know, comparably sized district in the in the country. Uh, so, with that in mind, and having been speaking to a number of parish councils who've really reiterated to me what you've just said, that there's a lot happening, everything with different timescales, everything with different ways of inputting into, and actually they're feeling really, really pressurised by it. So, um, I've had conversations um, with Cabinet and with uh, the Chief Executive, and uh, she and her leadership team are discussing uh, ways at which we can help support our communities to battle their way through this and to hopefully not feel so threatened by it and also to give them greater clar clarity over what our role is, what our level of influence is, what our position is and how we will be representing what they need. So that's, it's a very current topic at the moment. So thank you for raising it. Thank you, Leader. And thank you, Councillor Cathcart. Would you turn your microphone off now, please? please. Thank you. Right, I'm going to call a halt there and we'll move on. Thank you for that very thorough airing of views. We're going to. Yes, you've already spoken once, Councillor Roberts. The leader spoke a second time, but I'm not taking any further. Councillor Heather Williams is the leader of the Conservative group. I laid, allowed her to speak twice. I have not allowed anybody else to speak twice, and I don't intend to. As I said at the beginning of this meeting, I want this meeting to proceed quickly for reasons to do with COVID. Thank you. It is because she was the leader of the Conservatives that I allowed her to speak twice. Councillor Roberts, I'm calling a halt for reasons of time. We've had a good airing of the discussion, and I think it's time to move on. Thank you. No, it's because I think we've had a very long discussion and airing. And I, my feeling is 
As a council, we have understood exactly where people's concerns are. Thank you. I shall be moving on. Item 12. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Councillor Bygott. Point of Thank order. Chairman. What point of order are you bringing? Is there a distinction between the leader? Can I ask leader? what point of order yeah. you Is are? Is there a distinction no, between... No, can I ask what point of order you are bringing? Is it a matter of personal, personal explanation? No, no, it's about um, the standing order of who's allowed to speak. Is there a difference between the leader of a group and the convener of the independent? The, the, the ability for people to speak twice is at the chairman's discretion. I allowed the leader. I admit I also allowed Richard Williams to speak, but I'm calling a halt for reasons of timing. Is that a, is that a satisfactory explanation, Councillor Bygott? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I'm moving on to item 12. Thank you. I just want to go through the appointments to committees and other bodies, which is on page little two of our agenda. I plan to have a comfort break before we come to questions for two councillors, or from council, sorry. So, item 12, appointments to committees and other bodies. Members, your attention is drawn to the changes in membership or roles for the committees and other bodies as set out in the agenda. The first appointment at item A requires a vote. We are asked to note and endorse the replacement of Councillor Peter MacDonald by Councillor Henry Batchelor as the council nominated member on the investment partnership boards. Uh, can I ask, is there a proposal for that? Councillor Goff, thank you. And is there a seconder for that? Councillor Williams, John Williams. So are there any uh, comments on that? No. Okay, so does anybody wish to vote against that proposal? Okay, and are you content to take this decision by affirmation? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Does anybody wish to uh, object or abstain? No. Good. So this council therefore agrees the motion by affirmation. Would anybody wish for a short break in the meeting? Oh, sorry, yes. Sorry, I apologise. I, I, I thought there was a pause. Can I just wait for the break until we get to just before item 13? Next, we are asked to consider at B on page little two to note the following changes in the membership of committees or substitute appointments which have been made in accordance with the wishes of the leader of the political group to which the seats concerned have been allocated. As set out in the agenda, the change notified is in respect of the Climate and Environment Advisory Committee and is a replacement of Councillors Ruth Beckson and Nick Wright by Councillors Sue Ellington and Mark Howell as substitute members of that committee. We therefore note these changes and uh, I believe, are, are, are there any other changes of appointment to committees to note from the political group leaders. This is at item C. None from myself, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Williams. And leader? Um, no, but I do have one for D, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so D is to agree any changes required in the membership of outside bodies. Leader? Uh, thank you. Uh, so could you please note that um, the role of um, de my, de my deputy, my sub, on the Cambridge and Peterborough Combined Authority did sit with Councillor Neil Goff, but he's standing down from that role, and so Councillor John Williams will take over as my substitute on the Cambridge and Peterborough Combined Authority as of uh, as an immediate effect. Thank you very much, Leader. Uh, right, that brings item 12. Sorry, I apologise for getting to the end of that before we got to the end of it. Thank you. So, would anybody like a short break? Yes? Okay. So, can I suggest, I, by my watch, well, by the clock up there, it's 15.25. Can I suggest that we reconvene at 15.35? 10 minutes? No, 35. 10 minutes from now. For a short comfort break, yes? Do we agree? 
Or do we want... Okay, 15 minutes. In which case, uh, 15... Um, 40 by that clock on the wall. Thank you.
Council meeting of South Kent District Council after we've had a short break. So we're on item 13, uh, which is on page little three of our agenda pack. And members, you are reminded, this is, sorry, questions from councillors. Members, you are reminded that we have a period of 30 minutes for questions. This includes the question for which notice has been provided as set out on the agenda. And if there is still time remaining after those questions with notice have been dealt with, we'll then deal with any questions which have been notified to Democratic Services Manager in writing before the start of this meeting. So the first question is from Councillor Peter Fain. Councillor Fain, would you like to ask your question? Question as written on the order paper, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Fain. Uh, I invite Councillor John Williams to respond. Thank you, Chair. Um, first, generally in response to both this question from Councillor Fane and the next from Council, uh, Councillor Waters, I can let you know that a strategy to bring empty homes back into use as quickly as possible is being worked on at the moment using best practice from elsewhere and will be coming to Cabinet in the autumn. And it will take account of the issues highlighted by both councillors. Dealing with Councillor Fane's question specifically, we should bear in mind that we do have, of course, a general discretion under Section 13A of the Local Government Finance Act 1992, as inserted by Section 76 of the Local Government Finance Act 2003, to reduce or remit council tax should a council taxpayer apply for assistance using this opportunity. Empty homes can, of course, also be let to shire homes for housing homeless families. South Camps takes on the management of the property, which can include minor repairs to return them to use and the owner receives them a rent. However, I have to point out this cannot always be done in all cases. This council decided to charge the additional council tax for long-term empty properties in January 2013, effective from the 1st of April 2013, in line with the length of time the property had been unoccupied and subsequently unfurnished in accordance with the Local Government Finance Act to, uh, 2012. Under, section, under Part 11B of the Act, a property is a long-term empty dwelling on any day if for a continuous period of at least two years ending with that day. There is no provision for this period to be amended with a change of ownership, as Councillor Fain asked. In November 2018, the rating proper, property in common occupation and council tax empty dwellings act 2018 enabled the council to increase the additional amount charged and following a review of the long-term empty properties in South Cambridgeshire, in February 2019, this council agreed to increase the charges. The additional charges for long-term empty properties are listed in the annual council tax advertisement, are published on our website and are detailed in the information leaflet that is supplied with a council tax bill. Finally, I should, put, I should add that to put this into context, as of November 2018, when we increased the charge, we had 180 properties attracting additional council tax charge out of a tax base of over 62,600. While this month, the figure of long-term properties had slightly reduced to 171, out of a 2021 tax base that had increased to over 64,400. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, Councillor Fane, did you have any supplementary question? No, Chair, I don't see any need for that. I know that Councillor Waters has a similar question and I think that would probably cover the issue. Thank you. Councillor Bunty Waters. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for that um, very comprehensive uh, response. 
what I was actually asking though is, do we help, do we assist people who've got homes that need refurbishing, bringing up into livable um, conditions? Councillor Williams. Okay, well thank you. Well I'll answer both, both the question that's written and also the um, further question. Um, as of this Tuesday, 20 of July, there were 706 privately owned empty properties which have been empty from between one day and two years. So this figure does not include the longer term empty properties that I referred to in my answer to Councillor Fain's question. Council tax is collected from these homes. I should add that the 706 doesn't include unoccupied properties where someone has died and are going through probate. As to giving financial assistance to bring these properties back into use, the reasons for them being unoccupied can be many and varied. And this council has not until now had a comprehensive strategy to deal with this. This is why I hope shortly we will have such a strategy. Meanwhile, I should reiterate my earlier reply to Councillor Fain that we have discretionary powers to help with council tax hardship, which could provide financial easement to enable a property to be brought back into use. And as I say, there is also Shire Home. But as I repeat myself, as I said to you in response to Councillor Fain, that these issues are going to be taken into account in the new strategy. So, Councillor Waters, uh, are you satisfied or did you have any further questions? No, no further questions and thank you. For, I'm very pleased to hear that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Waters. So, uh, Councillor Tom Bygott, would you ask your question, please? Thank you, Chairman. Councillor on the order paper. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor, I invite Councillor Dr. Tim Hawkins to respond. Uh, thank you very much, um, Chair. Uh, Councillor Bygott, I thank you for your interest in the matter of Kingfisher Pond. Um, and I welcome it, considering the problem began to be noticed in 2015, when you and your conservative colleagues were in administration but did nothing about it. I will remind you that Councillor Sarah Chong Johnson and Alex Malion took up the matter in 2018. Thank you, Order Chairman. Mm. 12.7a, direct oral answer. The lead member for, for planning does not appear to be giving a direct oral answer. He's talking about things that have happened previously to this administration. And it clearly asks, what have they done and what is going on now? Uh, Councillor Thank Heather you. Williams, thank you for your, for your observation. My observation is that Councillor Bygott's question referred to water levels in Kingfisher Pond having, had de having declined, which is a past tense. So, can you carry on, Councillor Tim Hawkins, please? Thank you, Chair. You will recall that Councillor Sarah Chong Johnson and Alex Malion took up the matter in 2018 after they became councillors for the ward. And this administration began to address the issue. We commissioned H.R. Wallingford on behalf of Longstanding Parish Council to look into it, and we and the Parish Council have received the report. Given the conclusions and recommendations in the report, you will no doubt be pleased to know that we have developed an action plan that sets out the measures that the council proposes to follow to assist in resolving the issues identified. We have shared that action plan with local ward councillors and with the parish council. Once we get their feedback and agreement on the action plan, we can then start working with all parties identified to take the actions set out in it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, sorry, Councillor Dr. Tim Hawkins. Councillor Bygott, would you like to ask a supplementary question? So thank you very much. So I'm uh, very much looking forward to seeing the action plan when the time comes for us to be able to see it. So my supplementary question is that a revised application for North Stowe Phase 2A is currently pending with the Council. An up-to-date environmental statement is required for that application, but no environmental statement or up-to-date hydrological baseline data has been provided. If the Council is serious about protecting the environment at Northstow, why hasn't the Council requested that the applicant provide this information as required by law? Thank you. 
questions you wish to discuss? Uh, yes, I will. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bygoff. Uh, this is a matter that could very easily have been resolved um, by speaking to the case officer uh, or to myself, but um, I do not have the specific details for that application, and I'm happy to look into it and give you feedback after this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Heather Williams, would you like to ask your question? Thank you, Chairman, as on the order paper. Thank you very much. Uh, can I invite Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins to respond? Thank you, Chair. Um, directly, no, uh, not at all. Um, the shared planning service, with the exception of the last year when the COVID pandemic significantly adversely impacted both developer confidence and development activity has been able to operate inside the budget set by this council. Thank you, Chair. And Councillor Hawkins, do I understand that you're speaking on behalf of the leader in that uh, answer? That is correct, Chair. Thank you very much. Councillor Heather Williams, do you have any further questions? I do, Chairman, thank you. Um, so through yourself, Chairman, I'm, I'm assuming I'm now asking the lead member for planning, that um, I'd just like to cast back her mind back to page 333 of the 20th of February 2021 report, or 2020, I should say, um, which shows a credit figure of 851,000 against development management, so our department that processes applications, given the issues that there are in determining applications on time and getting them through the process, surely there should be some regret in that financial decision being made as our officers can only do what is within the resources that this administration gives them. And if the performance isn't there, I'd say that's purely the responsibility of them not being resourced properly. Councillor Hawkins? I know, that's what I was wondering. I'm not sure there's actually a question. The question is, do you regret that figure that I've quoted? That is the same as the first question that you asked? No. Uh, it says, does the leader regret the budget decisions the administration has made since 2018? And In general, I'm now asking specifically about the £851,000 that shows the credit figure on the budget that is specifically on development management. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins, did you, would you wish to respond? Or? Uh, I will respond. I don't keep figures in my head, but if there's a credit, I would imagine that it was because we couldn't get the uh, resources that we were trying to um, recruit. And as you very well know, there is a shortage of good planners in the country. Uh, we will continue to try our best to uh, resource in terms of people. And we have actually gone out to uh, recruitment and have succeeded in getting some more. And I'm happy to discuss that either with uh, Councillor Heather Williams or with Councillor Wright, who would be the um, planning person for your group. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dr. Hawkins. I understand we have uh, an additional question um, given with uh, less notice. Uh, from Councillor Richard Williams after the deadline. Uh, would you like to ask your question, Councillor Williams? Thank you, yes. Oh, sorry, I'm not sure if uh, the leaders had notice of this, but my question was, does the leader believe that the council should take enforcement action where breaches of planning rules are identified following complaints from residents? Thank you. Um, Councillor Hawkins, would you like to take that? Uh, yes, on, and on I do. This was addressed It was, um, and it has been delegated to me. Thank you very much. Thank respond. you, Councillor Dr. Hawkins. Do go ahead. Thank you, Chair. The Council receives a number of complaints about breaches of planning, or shall I say alleged breaches of planning, from many sources. And of course, the Environment Service, uh, the Enforcement Service responds to these uh, complaints. And where we identify a breach of planning regulation, we do have to consider whether the breach is one that is still actionable 
and can be pursued, and if it would be expedient for her to do so, bearing in mind the level of harm that was identified. There are breaches where further action is not considered expedient to be taken. And this is where there's a breach of planning control, but it's not considered to cause planning harm. And that taking action will not be proportionate. And of course, if enforcement is to be taken, we do have regard to national planning policy, uh, local plan policies, and all relevant materials. And of course, each case is dealt with on a case by case basis. So where there is an investigation of a planning breach, action will be taken as appropriate. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Dr. Hawkins. I don't think we have any other questions. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Councillor uh, Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. I didn't want to have to wait 10 minutes to come back for supplementary again. Um, thank you very much um, for, for, for that answer. I, I'm sure, as the lead member for planning knows, I'm sure as we all know, it often takes a great deal of courage um, for residents to come forward um, and report an alleged breach of planning. And it is very disappointing for residents, to put it mildly, when um, what the lead member referred to happens is that they're effectively written back to them and told, yes, there is a breach of planning rules, but we're not going to do anything about it. Now, there may be a very good reason for that, and I take on board everything um, Councillor Hawkins has said about the necessary balances, but would um, Councillor Hawkins and indeed the administration undertake to perhaps look um, at a slightly different system where, where a breach of planning um, is identified following a complaint from residents. At the very least, the enforcement team might write to the relevant householder to note that potential breaches of planning or likely breaches of planning have, have been identified and therefore invite them to apply to the appropriate commissions. So at least residents can see some action when um, they, as I say, often take the very courageous step um, in their individual cases to report breaches and they're not left feeling that the council really isn't listening to them at all and doesn't really care. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you. I think I understood the question there. Um, we will communicate better if that is your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. That wasn't quite my point. Um, my... Can I just ask Councillor Dr Hawkins um, if, if there's anything else in Councillor Richard Williams's question that you might wish to address. I'm sorry, but all the question I heard was, would we undertake to write to? Yeah, undertake to write to people responsible for the breach. Order, the, 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 the question has been supplementary posed. Okay. No responsibility. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, and remember, we have. Thank you very much, Councillor Van der Vey. Remember, we've said we don't need to stand up. Thank you. Um, the supplementary question has been put and been answered. Thank you. So, thank you for those questions. Thank you for those questions. Thank you for those questions. We will end it there. Item 14, notices of motion. Uh, you're reminded that a maximum period, you're reminded that a maximum period of 30 minutes is allowed for each motion to be moved seconded and debated, including dealing with any amendments. At the expiry of the 30-minute period, the debate will cease immediately and the mover of the original motion, or if the original motion has been amended, the mover of that amendment, now forming the substantive motion, will have the right of reply before the motion or the amendment is put to the vote. So, uh, the first question Sorry, first motion, thank you. Uh, item 14A has been withdrawn. Moving to 14B. Standing in the name of Councillor Heather Williams, would you like to put your motion, Councillor Williams? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm, while moving the amendment, I'm, I'm going to... Sorry, you're moving an amendment. Sorry, while I'm moving the motion, I'm going to bring forward the amendment as has been shared with me by Councillor Neil Goff on behalf of the Liberal Democrat group. I'm not going to say I'm happy about it, 
because essentially it changes everything apart from the first sentence. However, I'm pragmatic in this occasion, Chairman, and so I will accept it. The reason for me bringing this motion is because, I don't know if members are aware, but since May 2018, over 50% of Cabinet and full Council meetings have at some point resulted in exclusion of press and public. Personally, I believe that we should be as open as possible with residents and that it should be a last resort to exclude them. I'm going to stand by everything that is said and written in this original motion. It is in the public's interest that we share as much as is possible with them, and we are accountable to them. I'm still at a slight loss as to what the words public that we are accountable to, and it's in the public's interest that we are open and transparent as possible. I, I still, Chairman, struggle to know what is the issue with those words. However, being pragmatic, have accepted the changes once they're displayed, obviously. So we need to be really careful and remind ourselves who we serve. And Chairman, we do serve our residents. We are their public servants. And we need to be open with them. Currently, I feel that the balance is tilting the wrong way. And so I'm seeking to remind all members that we don't have to always go into private session, particularly in relation to minutes. While we may enter the original meeting, which you've not heard any issues from me on, Chairman, that's because something is commercially sensitive, potentially a deal is going to be done. Once that deal has happened, it is no longer commercially sensitive. However, this council has got into the habit of then still keeping those minutes confidential and away from the public. So, Chairman, that's what it seeks to do, a little reminder of why we're here and what we should be doing. It's not something, Chairman, that I thought would be controversial, given that we should all be standing for openness and transparency, but obviously it has had some issues within the administration. So I move this motion, Chairman, and I believe Councillor Goff is moving the amendment, which I will accept. So, uh, can we see the text of the amendment on Democratic Services? Well, we have to see what it is, don't we? Yeah, I'll share the amendment. Jonathan, Jonathan Moulton, could you, would you be so kind as to share the amendment on our screens? Uh, thank you, Chair. Unfortunately, I don't seem to have the amendment. Uh, would it be possible if Councillor Heather Williams could send that over to me, please? I think it's Councillor Goff's amendment. So, or has it been sent to any of the Democratic Services offices? Okay. Um, Chairman, if possible, could my motion be seconded before we get to the amendment, as is normal? The, first of all, we need to start with proposing your original, do we not? So, can I just ask you, are you proposing your original? Yes, Chair, well, I understand the process in this situation. Yes, if you. I move thank my you. motion, it gets seconded, then the amendment gets so moved. I'm just, as, which is what I'm trying to do, Councillor Williams, thank you. Who is your seconder Williams. for the original? Uh, I'm happy to second the original. Thank you very much, Councillor Cohn. Now, I understand there is an amendment to that, which we are hoping to see on our screens. Councillor Goff, I understand you have, are you able to? Just let's pause for a moment. I believe it will be there shortly. Chairman, with your, Chairman, with your permission, and may I request that Councillor Goff read the amendment in a nice, clear voice, and I'm sure that will be, be okay. And we'll get the meeting going as well. Um, I think. Oh, there we are. There we are. Here we are. Now, can I just clarify, on the normal web, as normal, the text that's being deleted is shown struck through. An additional text is being added at the end. 
Councillor Goff, would you like to read your amendment, or shall we all read it ourselves? Let's read it ourselves. Microphone. Can we just, can, can, I, can I read it? This council recognises that the minutes relating to private meetings can be made available to the public if the grounds for exclusion of the meeting no longer apply. The text that has been deleted is as follows. This council will seek to share the minutes of meetings where possible and will only keep them confidential as an absolute last resort, recognising that it is to the public that we are accountable and it is in the public's interest that we are of open and transparent as possible. So that text has been deleted. The following text has been added. This council recognises the importance of openness and transparency and will share the minutes of meetings wherever possible in accordance with the provisions of the law and the constraints of commercial confidentiality. Councillor uh, Heather Williams, are you happy to accept that amendment? Chairman, Councillor Cohn has seconded. He normally gets a chance to speak or be after his... Sorry, I'm asking if you accept that amendment to I'm your... We haven't followed the original process first, Chairman. Councillor Cohn's already seconded it. Yes, but he has a right to speak when he seconds it. But that's the motion as unamended, and I thought we'd taken the amendment. No, we haven't got to that bit yet. Fine. Councillor Cohn, would you like to speak? I, I oh. assume you're speaking on the original. Yeah. Okay, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so, sorry, Chairman, I'll be very brief. So, yeah, the, uh, as explained, I, I support the original um, uh, motion and I think actually everything that was written there um, was perfectly reasonable and I'm sad to see that the, the um, uh, amendment does somewhat water it down um, but for um, reasons of moving this issue forward I would be happy to accept the um, amendment as it's been put forward um, but I do think everything in the original um, motion was yeah, very relevant so th thank you for that Thank you, uh, thank you Councillor Cohn Would anybody else like to discuss this? Councillor Goff? Exactly. <laughs> Councillor Goff, we can't hear you. You might be better taking your mask off and speaking into yeah, the Yeah, I'd microphone. like to propose uh, the amendment, which was previously put on the screen and was um, uh, read out so kindly by you. So, yeah. Thank you. And I have a seconder. Who is your seconder? Councillor John Williams, thank you. So, Councillor Heather Williams, do you accept the amendment? Yes, Chairman, I accept the amendment. I'm thank sure Councillor Cohn will as well. Thank you. So, we'll take that as a substantive motion. Would anybody like to speak with a substantive motion? Councillor Goff and Councillor Cathcart. Councillor Goff. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and thank you to uh, Councillor Heather Williams for bringing this motion that, uh, as you say, it does give us the opportunity to recognise the importance of openness and transparency and remind us of that, and we very much endorse, endorse that. Um, the motion, the original motion was uh, two sentences. We kept the first one. I kept the first one exactly the same. Um, nevertheless, the motion second sentence doesn't really frame as well as it could the judgment and balance that has to be made on a case-by-case -case basis regarding withholding information and for that reason we have proposed I have proposed the following of that amendment let me explain why I have done so there are reasons supported by law why the minutes of meetings can be withheld that includes where the information concerns the financial or business affairs of the council because the disclosure of that information could potentially harm the interests of the council and therefore thereby our residents. For example, where we enter into the space where we're in competition with, negotiating with or partnering with other bodies, putting information into the public domain 
exposes that commercial information to parties that may be able to benefit from it against the interests of the council and our residents. Therefore, the right to withhold information uh, protects the interests of the council and the people we were accountable to. And that needs to be balanced on a case-by-case -case basis against the benefits of publication. And that is exactly what is provided for in the law. And the issue of public interest in, this, in these circumstances is one of balance. I would just like to point out to Council as Williams that even when you conclude a deal, there is some information which may still be commercially sensitive because the basis under which you negotiate or, or enter into that transaction is still commercially confidential and could be used against the interests of the Council. And as a person who previously, I entered into this, I can assure you that that is the case. The second sentence of the original motion introduced a new reference, um, Councillor Heather Williams, this concept of as a last resort. The only last resort of relevance is protecting the interests of the public. And that takes us right back to the need for exercising careful judgment and balancing the advantages and disadvantages of disclosure as provided for in the law. And that has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis, and the law requires all of those balances to be applied. Therefore, there's no benefit in the original sentence of the motion, which seeks to imply an interpretation to how those inherently complex judgments should be made. Our amendment makes it clear that this council strongly supports openness and transparency, but is clear about the balance and the basis under which it is to be followed in doing so. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to pick up on the point about the number of uh, meetings that um, we have to go into private confidential. I think, as everyone knows, over the past three years, uh, we've transformed this council. And before we um, came to this council, it basically had one commercial interest, which was Hermesty. And um, normally, when discussing um, financial situation of Ermine Street, that was done under private and confidential because it, we had financial information about properties. Point of information, we had Chairman. financial information about individual properties which yes. were not published in the minutes of that meeting. Since, since, since Point then, we have, we have broadened Councillor our... Williams, since could I then, ask you to just pause for a moment? There was no point of information. The point of information, Chairman, is that during the um, Ermine Street, most of it was done in open session. The lead member for finance, I believe, has just said that it was all done. No, I said I was done it was in closed done. session. No, the they majority have, of it, and very, very little of it, was done. Very, well, to be clear, very little was done in closed session, Chairman and we can go through the record to check it as Thank I have. Thank you. Thank you. You've made your point, Councillor Williams. Councillor John Well, as, as I pointed out, when we were discussing individual financial matters with Urban Street, they were taken in private and confidential. Now, since then, we have um, broadened our um, basket of commercial interest. We haven't had to put all our eggs in one basket with Urban Street. We have broadened that, and we've taken on other commercial um, activities, including partnerships. And clearly, therefore, this council, by doing that, has had to go into private and confidential session when discussing the negotiations um, with regard to the financial and other interests of third parties. If we weren't able to do that, then we wouldn't be able to come to our decisions on very important matters for the residents of this uh, th this district. Um, and of course, we wouldn't be able to discuss uh, and disclose financial and other interests of, of our partners and others that are involved with our commercial uh, um, acquisitions. So that's the reason why there has been an increase in the number of uh, meetings that we have you know, and, and it doesn't come second nature to us at all not to disclose everything. You know, the Liberal Democrats believe in very much open government 
but there are occasions where we must ensure to protect ourselves, protect the council and our residents, that we must ensure that commercial sensitive information is kept in private and confidential. I'd also like to point out that, of course, every time we go into a private and confidential session, they, that is taken by a vote, um, and um, those who disagree uh, with us doing that can always vote against that. And also, um, the minutes of those meetings, there is a, um, a public minute issued of those, of those meetings. So it's not true to say that no minutes are, 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 public, pub, are published of those meetings. And again, those minutes have to take into account the commercial sensitivity of what's being discussed. So that's why you know, there has been an increase. It's been an increase because there's been an increase in our commercial activity over the past three years. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Um, can I, I understand that Councillor Trevor Roberts would like to speak. This is, so now, just to be clear, we're in the debate about what is now the substantive motion. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman, quite understood. Uh, and I won't be supporting it uh, because um, it appears to me that uh, what was being uh, put forward for consideration was to make sure that uh, this actually happened and that we were showing ourselves to be open and transparent and getting the details out. It has now been twisted in such a way, in my opinion, to actually negate it because there's no guarantee now. Uh, it will be, well, maybe, and perhaps, and well, if this happens or mm, if that happens. So I think it actually negates it. And I think, I, I'm sorry to say, I think the proposer and seconder should have actually not accepted it, but that's their prerogative. However, um, my feelings about this is that um, you've actually given us, Councillor Williams, the very reasons that it should be open to the public. The fact is that this council has got into the very murky bed of developers. We could have put our money into lots of different pots um, in the financial sector, as do lots of businessmen put their money into all sorts of um, transactions, not necessarily bricks and mortar, but into, into the other world of finance and pensions and all sorts of things. However, we have decided to become the property developers. And we are in bed with a certain property uh, agency. And yes, that must make it very difficult for us, doesn't it? Because we're actually spending or borrowing um, lots of money um, to benefit ourselves. And uh, if it all goes pear-shaped, I'm sure that uh, it's required by the um, controlling group to have as little down on paper as possible for uh, the blame to be um, pinged at them, like the government and it's pinging. Um, so um, it seems to me that this is still, what has been put forward by the Liberal Democrat controlling group is an attempt to actually not be open and transparent, to be actually the very opposite of that, to make sure as little as possible is known about what they're up to, um, how much of the public's money they are spending. Um, and so if it all goes pear-shaped, um, they really think they'll get away with it. Or in my opinion, that's what they think they'll get away with. So I'm, I'm not accepting this. I don't accept any of the arguments that, that has been made by Councillor Williams, um, Liberal Democrat Councillor Williams. Um, this is not an acceptable way. We are answerable to the public. We should not be ashamed or frightened, even if we think it's going to have an effect on who's going to vote for us, of actually accounting for ourselves and accounting for the way that we are spending not our money, but the residents' money. Many who are actually under a great deal of financial pressure themselves, but would actually like to know what we are doing. Thank you. Uh, can I ask that uh, Jonathan Cook Moulton puts the wording of the amendment back up on the screen? So we have that in front of us as the debate progresses. Jonathan, would you be able to do that? Great. 
Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Councillor Cathcart, I believe you wish to speak. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we should support openness. But Cathcart, and would you like to take the mask off? Please. Thank you. We should support openness and transparency. However, there are occasions clearly when negotiations take place. It happens in all stages of life. It happens in commerce, it happens in central government, it happens on this council. Uh, and you have to, I think, recognize the circumstances where those discussions and suggestions can actually be, 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 be considered in, in some degree of confidentiality. You usually find no final decision has been made, but a, a final decision is taken at a later stage in the process anyway. But I think for preliminary discussions, you do have to preserve that degree of, of, of confidentiality in order to make sure that those people coming to those meetings can actually uh, speak re fairly freely about the fact that they're, what they're going to say will instantly get into the Cambridge GB News the next day, in fact. You know, that will not be in anyone's interest because you won't be able then to have the free and open discussions which we all value. Um, so I think a reasonable degree of protection still needs to be built in. Um, also, the motion is slightly vague. It talks about private meetings. In a, in a sense, when you look at it, uh, numerous private meetings take place with this authority, meetings between individuals who have a proposal with a planning officer and they want to have a discussion. Presumably, and this requires clarifications, we wouldn't be saying that all private meetings would be a presumption in favor of releasing information or individuals concerning someone's degree of confidentiality. Uh, issues, presumably, we're only talking here about meetings between members uh, and other uh, uh, individuals, but not those myriad of relatively small-scale private meetings, which are the sort of the, the nuts and bolts of the council. I just want that point to be clarified, because otherwise we could be in the position of every single meeting with the hub, two or three people taking place be subject to actually, um, uh, 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 you know, being published in the paper. I just want to make those couple of points. Thank you, Councillor Cathcart. Are there any other requests to speak, Councillor Igot? Thank you, Chairman. So I'm uh, very much in support of this motion, uh, as indeed we all are, I believe, um, because we need to have an open and transparent debate. Um, I would have supported a stronger motion, and so I'm a little bit disappointed that the um, uh, group in power has sort of watered it down a bit. Um, so I'm not going to um, request another uh, amendment. So we but are I losing would, you slightly, Councillor. I would Michael. like. Do, do continue to speak up. I would like to call on the leadership to show some leadership and make a public commitment that once the um, minutes uh, that are confidential for commercial reasons no longer need to be confidential, that the uh, the council does make a commitment to then release those minutes and make them make them public. Now, one of the things that um, <laughs> Councillor Roberts mentioned uh, was the uh, the partnership with the developer in Camborne Business Park. And I think it is incredibly important that if we're going to be, as a council, acting as a property developer, we still retain our role as a regulator of developers. And in some senses, we're regulating ourselves. And I think it's incredibly important to the public that the public see that we are regulating developers and we are holding them to account. And they need to know that we are doing our function as we are required to do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bygott. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? No. Right. I think we'll go to the vote. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, sorry. As a proposer of the amended motion. Thank you. Sorry. Apologies. Councillor Heather Williams. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Councillor Cathcart, you've already spoken once. Sorry, Councillor Cathcart, point of clarification, do please turn on your microphone. Sorry. Um, this question of private meetings, can we be assured that small meetings between individuals or perhaps uh, some of a, a planning application won't be subject to... Um, uh, publication because these uh, these are usually private anyway. The, the problem is, if Councillor we Cathcart, actually, 
you, I believe you are reiterating the point that you made earlier. Oh, yes, but I just want clarification that it won't apply in those case, in these cases. That's what I'm asking for. Okay, right. Thank you, Councillor Cathcart. I think we understood your point and you were seeking clarification. Councillor Henry Batchelor. Thank you, Chair. Um, given the way the debate's going, I feel I need to probably declare an interest given the fact that um, the various partnerships that we are invested in have been mentioned and I have at this meeting just been elected to represent the council. I should probably declare that as an interest. Thank you very much, Councillor Batchelor. Did anybody else wish to speak on behalf of Councillor Richard Williams? Sorry, Thank Councillor you, Chair. Richard. And I'm looking to you uh, for guidance on this, but to help out Councillor Cathcart, would it be in order for me to propose an amendment? So it says this council recognises that the minutes relating to private meetings of the council and its committee. Are you uh, mind to accept happy, that? Chair? I'm happy to accept that, Chair. Could we just clarify? clarify? Thank you. Could we just clarify, Dr. Richard Williams, would you like to come forward? What's the amendment again? Um, could you the just clarify? You were adding the word and this council. I, it's gone off screen now, but I was adding the words of this council and its committees. Uh, so, as I understand it, Councillor Heather Williams, you were prepared to accept that amendment to this council standard. Yes, I am, if it helps clarify things as Councillor Cathcart says. Thank you. Councillor um, Parsons. Parsons? <laughs> yes, do go ahead. As, as Chair of the Audit and Corporate Governance no, we Committee. We can't hear you. Councillor Mason, do, do turn your microphone. Oh, you're on. Right. <laughs> can't hear that. Thank you. As, as Chair of the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee... You're still very I'm, quiet. Oh, sorry, I'm good. This is why I don't speak. As, as Chair of the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee, I, I am frequently in meetings with the auditors that are private and confidential, and the discussions in those meetings should not be made public, because it is only by having those meetings with the auditors and the internal auditors that we will get an honest viewpoint. So uh, adding committees to that amendment gives me cause for concern. So you would be opposing the addition of and committees? Removal. Can I just take advice from our legal advisor? Um, just to say that I would be happy that if the amendment were passed, it wouldn't cover the situation that you're referring to as committees in the sense of committees set up under the Local Government Act 73 to find accounts that are rich and women does not in. So um, hopefully that will allay your fears. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Milnes. Thank you. I just wanted to check that uh, this wasn't an entirely superfluous uh, amendment. The operation of the Council is uh, principally done through its committees, so it is one and the same thing. So I don't, I don't believe that it actually added any clarification whatsoever. Point of order, Chairman. I've accepted it. We'll proceed and uh, I'm mindful that we don't have much long before the end of this. Could you make it brief, Councillor Goff? Could we see, could we see the amendment? I'm sorry, sir? Could we see the amendment? Uh, thank you, yes, we've got the amendment up. So where was it we were going to... It's, it's in the first sentence after private meetings, which was common actually between Councillor Williams's motion and my amendment motion. So can we just clarify, this council recognises that the minutes relating to private meetings, what was the wording then? Of the council and of its the committees. Council. Of the council and of its, the council committees. And its committees. committees. It was to address Councillor Cathcart's point, but to clarify that we're not talking about private meetings with residents. What, what I was going to say is I, I think it's a good amendment given that Councillor Cathcart raised the issue and private meetings can be interpreted as private meetings outside. I think it's fine and we should... Uh, Thank you, Councillor Goff. 
and you've amended, Councillor Heather Williams has accepted that amendment. So we'll go to the vote, thank you. We'll I get some up, Chair. Sorry. You go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Could um, I just ask that you do it quickly, otherwise we're going to run out of time. I, so. I will not use more than the time that is allowed Please for me, ahead. Chairman. Um, so I, th I think I'll just remind people for the we vote about the first sentence. It does say minutes. It's minutes relating to private meetings, Chairman. I think people are seeing this as all private meetings. It is very specific in there. Um, I, I get the impression I, I'm being inferred to that it's incredibly complicated and people just can't understand it, or perhaps it's that I can't understand it, Chairman, because, funny enough, I think I can. Um, there's nothing legally incorrect in this, nor the previous one. And uh, other commercial activities and partnerships, what Councillor John Williams raises, yes, this council has gone into different ventures. Sorry, Councillor Williams, could I just, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to point out that we have 30 minutes for each motion in total. So I'm just trying to avoid us running over that time. Please do be succinct. Might run over it now, Chairman. But, um, but yes, so... But that, in turn, has increased the risk that we're exposing taxpayers' money to. So I think it's right that we find a balance um, and that we shouldn't just, as has been said, to protect ourselves. It must be about protecting residents and being open and accountable to them. So I hope, after the amendments and the agreed amendments, that we will see some uniform support for this. But, um, but yeah, it is a shame, Chairman, that... Uh, it has taken so long to get to agreement on something which should be done without saying. Okay, can we take the vote? Uh, so can I just ask whether it is agreed by affirmation or do we have to take it by a vote? No, I think Councillor Roberts will object. To no, we have to... one objector, so we do need to take it by a vote. Uh, so please, can uh, we step up to vote? Ah, we, we have the opportunity to vote on our um, handsets. I, I note Councillor Bygott. Councillor Roberts, can you see the vote? So, can we take your, is it Councillor Bygott who's, okay. Can we take your vote by an indication verbally? Are we allowed, we're not? Okay. Which way would Councillor Bygott like to vote? Thank you. Can we take those as noted and everybody else vote on the uh, microphones? Sorry, that disappeared very quickly. Oh, yeah. So that would be a total of 25 agreed, including Councillor Bygott's verbal vote. No again, none against, and two abstentions. Three, three, three abstentions. In, uh, I think Councillor Roberts, did you record your abstention on your microphone? So it's two abstentions. So that vote is carried. Thank you. Moving on to 14C, standing in the name of Councillor Dr. Ian Solom. Uh, can I ask Councillor Solom to propose his motion? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, there are over 6 million families on universal credit now. That's uh, more than double what it was pre pandemic. Sorry, Councillor Solomon, can I just ask you to speak up a little, please? Thank you. That's more than double than what the figure was pre-pandemic. And all of those families are facing a cliff edge when the £20 uplift per week was removed at the end of September, as the government has indicated that it intends to follow through with. 
that cut, and it is a cut, will disproportionately affect single parents, 90% of who of whom are women. It will disproportionately affect black and ethnic minority families and households that include someone who's disabled. It will put more than half a million people in po poverty, including 200,000 children. And I know that this council was incredibly concerned in November when we brought a motion about free school meals during holiday time without children being in poverty. Universal credit isn't just about people being out of workforce. Nearly two-fifths of universal credit uh, adults in families receiving universal credit are in employed. It is an in-work benefit. And the range at which the £20 cut is in terms of a cut in their income varies between about 8% and 28%. So it is significant. And as noted in the motion, this will affect living standards of those people. It's simply not right to take income away from those lowest income families at, the at a time when they need it most. We are still in the, in the pandemic. And the fact that there was a 20 pound uplift in the first place at the beginning of the pandemic was an implicit acknowledgement that it wasn't enough to live on. The evidence of the, from the public on this, and there's been research done, that what the public thinks a minimum income standard is, is barely, it is more than double, or nearly more than double, um, depending on exactly what the circumstances are, of what, uh, what universal credit provides. So, like those six former ministers of state since 2010, we really need to let the government know that this is affecting, will be affecting our residents and let them know that it's wrong. So I urge the council to, to, to back this, this motion. I have amended the motion slightly in order to make it clear that uh, about the uh, list of, of named people there being uh, former ministers in the Department for Work and Pensions, rather than former leaders of the Conservative Party, as it could have been read. And also just a slight change on the word deplores, we have moved it to something that I believe was more acceptable to the opposition, and certainly from my perspective, I think strongly disapproves is probably the dictionary definition of deplores, so I'm, I'm happy to go with the definition. Thank you. So uh, I'm taking that amended version as we have on the screen. Can I understand whether you have a second to for your amended motion? For my amended motion, I do have a second, but that's Thank Councillor you. Ripple. Councillor Judith Ripple. Thank you very much. Just one moment. Would you like to speak now, Councillor Ripley? To remove the £20 uplift in universal credit in the next few months on the 1st of October from the most vulnerable in society is, to my mind, unacceptable. This, world, this would coincide with the end of furlough. The pandemic has not gone away as cases rise and hospitalisations too, both locally and nationally. This is the worst time to do this. 
as a society and as a council, we need to do everything within our power to ensure this uplift is made permanent to help support our most vulnerable citizens. Therefore, I'm happy to support Councillor Dr Ian Solomon's motion and hope this council will vote in favour of it. Thank you, Councillor Ripper. So we have a motion that has been amended and opposed and seconded. Thank you. Would anybody like to speak? Thank you. I have Councillor Heather Williams and Councillor Deborah Roberts. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and I appreciate the conversation that's been had between myself and Councillor Solomon at uh, Solomon in this um, in this motion. Um, I do think that at this time, many of us here, we welcomed the extra £20, and at this time it is appropriate to keep it. We do have families here in South Cams, but others in other areas struggling also. Um, so I hope that we will join together today in sending the message that we would like to see it kept, and the extra £20 that on the original uplift. Um, and from, from our point of view today, we will show that we will put people before party politics, as we should all be doing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Heather Williams. Councillor Deborah Roberts. I really, I really am not sure why, well, yes, I am sure why, but why this is actually being put forward as an agenda item for us. We can't make an eighth of a difference to it. Um, there's no actual factual information here as to exactly what the financial implications would be. And I go along with both the proposer and the seconder that we've still got a, a situation of, uh, of a COVID experience going on. But, you know, hospital um, input uh, is a lot, lot lower than it was. Very few people in reality are actually uh, now fatalities and so you know we are getting to be in a much better place really and there's an absolutely i was listening to radio 4 at lunchtime and actually the um, cases have gone down quite dramatically in the last two days as well so we appear to have got over um, the, the high again um it, it's where is this money tree that you lot think um is growing somewhere because today we've got the um, hospitals union saying they aren't going to accept the, the new up um, from 1% to 3% for wages in the NHS. And in fact, they want 15%. Um, clouds and cloud cuckoo lands and pigs might fly comes to mind. Um, but, you know, then we've got the teachers now saying that, having heard that, that they're entitled to a rise as well. And then you'll get all the other services. And, um, and what about the military, who never seem to be, get anybody's attention, care or interest? Um, and you know, there has to come a time when you really do have to ask yourself, how far is the uh, welfare state uh, expected to provide for everybody and everybody's needs and everybody's desires um, and, you know, I, I might have gone along with this if we'd had some more um, information here and explanations of how and why we should be looking at only this and not lots of other things. Um, and it, it seems to me that there's an awful lot, um, I'm sorry to say, a virtual signal thing going on here. Let's tell all our residents that we are terribly caring, sharing, hands-on, woke, what your problems are our problems, etc. And so it seems to me that this, this should never should have been put forward. Um, if we as individual councillors want to speak to our MP and support him, that, that's absolutely fine. And as I say, there may be a case for this, but it hasn't been put to me and, and we, we haven't got any details and we're not looking at the um, possible impact and and uh, what we, will happen 
if you did this for this one group. Um, and this is what is happening. Different, different uh, groups are now being given priority over others. And there's many, uh, there's many uh, uh, on the bread line, on, the, on that line between poverty and being okay, in this district who are suffering greatly. And because they're just above that line, nobody's doing anything for them. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Councillor Cathcart. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I fully support this motion. I think it would uh, obviously uh, the pandemic may be uh, winding down or might not be. We don't know. But the damage will be permanent, at least semi-permanent, over the last few years to damage people's livelihoods, damage families, a whole range of things. And that's exactly what this universal credit is supposed to be, a sort of a safety net to ensure that there is a reasonable degree of protection, which is the mark of any civilised society. So I'm more than happy to fully endorse it. I mean, uh, Councillor Roberts makes some valid points, actually, that choices may have to be made in the future. Um, but I think this is something we need to support. This should be given the highest priority because it will help a significant number of people. But yes, let's look at, or maybe put up taxes, you know, there may be all sorts of ways we can do it. <laughs> But I don't, we'll not be having that debate today. Thank you, Thank Councillor you. Roberts. Has, I think Councillor Cathcart has finished speaking. Thank you. Can I ask the members not to interrupt each other? Thank you. One person at a time. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Chairman, I haven't requested speech again. I just requested a comfort break after this motion. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, Councillor Solem. Did you, did your, we've heard from your seconder, would you like to sum up? I don't, can't see anybody else wishing to speak on this motion. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief, um, summing up. Um, I, I think, contrary to, to Councillor Roberts, that it is a responsibility of this council to make representations to central government when we feel it is an issue of vital importance. And it seems to be, and I'm pleased to hear, that it is regarded as an issue of vital importance to this council. The uplift would cost, or maintaining the uplift would cost about six billion, I believe, to answer some of the specific questions. That would take the, the, the universal credit bill from 68 billion to 74 billion. It sounds like a, a lot, fortunately it's not huge. The way to reduce that welfare bill is to get people back into work and have a strong economy and a strong recovery out of the pandemic to reduce that welfare bill. It's not to just slash benefits to people who are most vulnerable. So I'm really pleased to hear that people will support it, and I'm, I'm happy that uh, this is voted against. Thank you, Councillor Solem. With no further requests to speak, uh, let's take that to the vote. Could I ask members, is, is everybody in support, or is anybody objecting? Okay. Thank you. So can I understand, it seems to me most of the people here would like to support the vote. Can we, rec can we register your abstention? Can we take that by affirmation with the recognition of that one abstention? Are we agreed? Thank you very much. Yep. I'd just like to take a five minute comfort break, please, for the benefit of members. Ten minutes, okay. So that takes it from 16.50. We'll come back into the room at 16.60, please. So that'll be, in fact, 5 o'clock. <laughs> Otherwise known as. Thank you.
yes, Corinne Garvey had left in the, in the previous break. Sorry? Councillor Mallion. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, moving on swiftly after that break, we're now looking at item 14D, uh, and this is a motion standing in the name of Councillor Pippa Halings. Councillor Halings, would you like to present your motion? Thank you very much. Well, I think, you know, we all know that there are some reforms that are needed to the planning system, but these need to be sensible and, and pragmatic. And with nine in 10 planning applications approved by councils and more than a million homes given permission that haven't yet been built, um, you know, it's more the housing delivery that's the problem rather than the planning system in itself. And there's been significant disquiet and even amongst conservative MPs about some of the changes being proposed. And I want to just look at two of them. And the first is protecting the voice of local communities in the planning system. One thing I believe we all protect fiercely as local members of whatever party is the democratic voice of our local residents in shaping the future of their area. And in my ward of Histon, Impington, Orchard Park, and there's all, all wards, I am sure, you know, we know how much time, care, expertise, effort, and knowledge that's brought um, to bear on single applications on proposed sites, both small and large. And then at planning committee, those committee members know we, you know, we then invite in parish councils and any um, residents who either you know, object um, to an application that could change their neighborhood or their village or their town. And that feeds into our discussion as members about the balance between the benefits and harms of a kind of a complex um, application and ensure our policies are being respected. But these reforms would do away with that only allowing local residents' voice at the local plan-making stage, and basically at the outline stage of very, very large, um, what they call the growth zones. So it's kind of hard to understand. In the name of enabling the building of no new homes to tackle the housing crisis, the government seems intent on unraveling the planning application and planning approval system, um, and just providing developers with automatic permission, basically, um, in these areas zone for growth, which you know, means it's nothing more than a developer's charter. And think they can size applications where the local authority and the local residents, their voice can only be heard at the outline stage, where everything is indicative. And that's basically what this means. And secondly, we all share about the importance of ensuring the supply of affordable housing. So the reforms proposed to replace Section 105 and SIL with um, a new infrastructure levy. And unfortunately, there's just lack of any detail to know whether this levy that will be calculated nationally will maintain the existing levels of funding for council housing and for affordable housing. And especially with the proposal to raise to 40 or 50 units the threshold for affordable housing compared to the existing 10 units. The Cheshire and Amish and by-election results are, you know, were a wake-up call that residents were very, very unhappy about um, the government reform. And I hope our local MPs um, will support this and play their role and exert pressure to, on behalf of their residents, to question these reforms and protect the voice of residents. And I do hope that we can support this, this motion together. Councillor Halings, do you have a seconder? I do, Councillor Dr. Kim Hawkins. Okay, do you wish to speak now or wait? Thank you. Uh, and I understand we have a request to speak from Councillor Heather Williams. And I can see Councillor Bygott, Councillor Wright, Councillor Roberts, Councillor Cathcart. Well, they weren't in that order, but um, I'll take them in due course. Councillor Heather Williams, did you wish to... Chairman, I have an amendment I wish to move. Right. Ross Holt, R. Thank you. Sorry. Do go ahead, Councillor Heather Williams. Chairman, it has been submitted, so I don't know if you want to display it. Um, so, Jonathan Moulton. I haven't seen it. Thanks. 
I haven't seen it either, but it is on the screen. So I'm going to give us quiet, please, for a couple of minutes while we just read this carefully ourselves. Would you like me to read it out for you? For the people at home? I can see it very well. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Okay. Just give me a moment to read it. Chairman, would you like me to read it as I read the amendment? Can, I, can you just give us a moment to read it ourselves? Uh, read it, and then I'll give you a chance to talk to it. Thank you. So, it is the first bullet point that's been amended. Please carry on, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. So, the amendment, to be clear, removes to work together with developers and replaces it with, so it reads, local communities are empowered and heard by the local planning authority when shaping local areas and delivering new homes that are affordable to live in. Um, I think many of us will agree with maybe not all, but much of what has been previously said. However, we do feel, and I particularly feel, that we should to include, given what has actually been referenced in moving the motion, to then include saying we're going to work with developers. Actually, we need to be enforcing things. We need to be implementing our policies. Um, and we are the ones that need to be in charge of the situation as we're the ones that regulate it. So I'm hoping it's a very small amendment um, and, I, and I seek to remove the um, suggestion of working with developers as I feel that that may more benefit as well the words that were moved in moving the motion. Chairman, I think I don't need to say any more to the amendment. Obviously, post-amendment, I would like to speak to the substantive item. Thank you. Do you have a seconder, Councillor Williams? Thank you. Councillor Roberts, are you seconding the amendment? I am, Chairman. Thank you. If you wish to now, you may. I sure appreciate it. Um, through you, Chairman, um, I really supported a lot um, that Councillor Haling's said. I think a lot of us feel a great deal of concern, um, you know, whatever our non-politics we have. Um, and I think it's really uh, important that we, we try to make, um, you know, our voices heard, um, if, we, if at all. But I, I was unhappy about um, the first paragraph, uh, this council and that first paragraph, because um, I also, and taking up what Councillor Halings was saying, that she was wanting to get our residents to be very much listened to and involved. And I think that um, putting the developers line in is just changing that. I think we need to concentrate on um, our feelings and our concerns about our residents. I think once you start bringing in developers in as well, if you put that in, they have got so much advantage against our residents. They, they have often unlimited money, um, unlimited professional help, and, and I have seen them at various places, various parish council meetings over the years. They come to those meetings, and it's supposed to be about talking to the parish council. Actually, they lecture the parish council. They basically inform the parish council what, uh, what should be happening, which is beneficial to them. And, and I think that, yes, we can still continue um, our officers speaking to developers, but I think that this motion is to do something different. It's to actually give our residents the assurances that they do have a voice and that we want that voice to be heard, um, uh, not this business with the developers. So I'm very much supporting um, the amendment as made. I've got absolutely no problems with the second part as uh, Councillor Halings has put down. I think that's e excellent. That's exactly what we are trying to do. So I may be hoping she'll accept it. Thank you very much, the amendment. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Can I come back to uh, the proposer and seconder of the motion to uh, establish whether you accept the amendment? Councillor Fitzgerald.
for hailing. Yeah, no, and, and thank you for, you know, being so, I would think, I, well, I know, especially with those on the committee, that we all share our concerns around this. So thank you again for this, the support around this. Um, and I can understand, in a way, the spirit of this, but actually what I, I can't accept it, because what I think it's doing is the whole focus of this motion is about stopping the reforms from taking away power both from local authorities and residents. It's not a question of empower, of, of making the local authority listen more to residents. This is about reforms which are taking both local authorities and residents out of the equation. And I think we need to focus on that. And I can understand what you're saying about the, the developers. I hear what, where you're saying, but my intention behind this is that what we need to do is get the balance right. And that the You wish to speak to the amendment. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chairman. And, and it is it is the amendment. It's the bit about developers working with developers really alarms me because the developers are the ones who are pushing these reforms. And you know, developers, it is so difficult having worked in planning, as has Councillor Roberts and a few others for a long, long time. Working with developers, developers answer to their profit margin. That is, and their shareholders and owners. And that is their interest. It is making the profit. And, and you know, you are trying to work with a shark. Uh, not, you know, in the nicest possible way. You will get eaten alive in the process. And it is, you know, it is so difficult. We, it is so balance against local communities and you know we need to work with support and work with our communities many of whom we represent and that is our task here and as a local planning authority it is keeping that balance fair between the statutory requirements of the law and you must remember that planning is a statutory process that only has, you know, the, as councillors, we have a tiny bit at the end, you know, that we can actually have a say on. You know, 98 point something percent of the planning applications now are decided by delegation and officers. And we're left as councillors with that tiny bit at the end. And, you know, uh, and not wishing wishing to lose the support of the administration, but that has got worse 
over the last three years in the, with the terms of reference changes, uh, you know, the, uh, and the, the, the stuff that councillors and parishes can now bring to committee declining, that is being marginalised even more. And it, it's difficult to lecture the government on changes in the reforms when we're not able to support that by what the administration has done itself in this authority. So I'm dead in favour of local communities having the support that they need, particularly from the local planning authority and us, in protecting this tiny bit of democracy at the end of the statutory process that is planning. And I, I just think it's a really bad mistake to, to leave working with developers in there instead of working with communities. And that's all I've got to say on the top line. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Can I just check, uh, when I mentioned Councillor Howell before, did you say no, you hadn't got it? Okay, thank you. So it's Councillor Cathcart. I think probably on a substantive motion. Yeah, I, I agree. With no, we're well. talking about the amendment at the moment, Councillor Cathcart. Oh, wait, not, I thought it was a choice. You could either speak on the amendment or... No, but you'd have to wait to speak under the substantive. Right, okay, yeah? fine. Thank you. Uh, Councillor van der Veer, did you wish to speak to the amendment? I, I wish to speak to the amendment. Thank yes. you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I, while I certainly sympathise with, with the sentiments expressed by the speakers um, in favour of the amendment um, so far, I, I think there has been a misunderstanding. D developers are involved in the planning process. We do work with developers now, as, as Councillor Wright was saying. We do that so now, and we have to in the future. And what, what this, this is the um, uh, original motion is saying, is that we need to have more power for communities in that relationship. That relationship is not going to go away. We can't uh, escape from it. Um, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the power for the communities needs to be focused on things like shaping uh, the local areas, which is, which is what this is about. So I, I think this is based on a, a misunderstanding of, of the, of the um, uh, um, uh, original motion. Uh, so I, I, I think the, the, this actually, the amendment actually reduces um, uh, the weight of the, um, of the original motion. Thank you, Councillor van der Veer. Uh, the next speaker is Councillor Richard, Dr. Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm a bit perplexed now um, after what Councillor van der Veer has just said, um, because I don't understand why you don't accept the amendment then, um, if, if you're not suggesting that, local, that, that developers aren't important and you don't expect communities to work with them. But Point of information, uh, I was saying the contrary. I, I do expect communities to work with them, but communities need to have more power. Community, local communities need to be empowered. This is what this uh, uh, original motion says. Yeah, oh, okay, um, so um, how then? How are you going to empower them? If, if you want to empower local communities, I how just are you going ask to do it? you, Councillor um, Dr. Richard Williams, please address your. Uh, points to me, the oh, chair, okay. and then we will avoid a conversation thank between you, you and Councillor van der Veer. Thank you. Fair, fair point. Thank you, chair. Thank you, chair. Fair point. Okay, so via you, chair, or just a general question, um, one of my concerns about the original motion is it calls for um, the community to work with developers, and I would ask how. Um, Councillor Roberts has already said there is an imbalance of power. That is the fundamental problem with developers. They don't have any incentive to listen to local communities because they, they just want to be lovely, nice people. They want to maximize their profits, and they will listen, or they will appear to listen, to the extent that they think it will help them to get their planning application through and damp down local opposition. But there is no incentive to work with um, local uh, communities in a meaningful way. So how are you going to empower them? Are you going to abolish the role of the local planning authority and give complete discretion to parish councils um, to decide planning applications. That would certainly give um, some uh, local communities some power um, to deal with um, developers and to work meaningfully with them because they'd have to. Um, so I'm unclear as to what actually you intend by the original motion. Um, I do think the amendment is actually much more reflective of the overall objective of, of your motion, which actually I fundamentally um, agree with. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, all right, our next speaker is Councillor Claire Dorrington. Councillor Claire Dorrington, did you wish to speak? Oh, okay. 
my, for once, my trusty vice chair has, has misidentified uh, Councillor Milnes. I just find it very interesting. Councillor Milnes, do bring your microphone a little closer, please. Thank you. Could I also, just in general, could I ask members when they speak to avoid doing this? Because it blocks the microphone from your voice. Thank you. I hope you can hear me now. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Oh, dear. <laughs> it's just a bit rich to hear our Tory colleagues complaining of the role of developers in planning. I just cite dinner with Jenwick. And I, uh, the, we are trying our best, and put a motion here that signals our, in, uh, our reservation with the new planning uh, white paper and proposals before us. And we all seem to actually agree, actually. So this is really just a silly time-wasting uh, exercise that isn't actually adding anything to the debate. Because the fundamental Point of debate. Personal explanation, Chairman, uh, 15.14. Go ahead, Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Keep um, it short. I, would, I would be short, but this is not a silly amendment. This says working with developers. We here, as elected councillors, who, yes, serve a, a different party to the one that Councillor Mills. But right. we are so not Tory colleagues. We are elected is members. It's not anything to do with accuracy. Are you referring to another rule of debate? No, I'm saying the personal explanation. Thank you. And it was said that it's a silly amendment just to drag time. I'm personally explaining that as elected members, we're entitled to raise our concerns well, and have them heard. Entitled and you've made your point. Thank you. We understand. Thank you. Do carry on, Councillor Mills. Oh, I'm <laughs> I've made I've made my point. We've, we've, I, I'm voting against this. So, if you've uh, made your you. point, that's great. Thank you, Councillor Betson. I believe you'd like to take a have a question. Thank you, Councillor Betson. Do go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I um, would welcome the um, amendment because taking into consideration um, the development at Tambourne Business Park. I would give an example, um, and, and to Councillor Mills, perhaps he's not aware of this. On the 8th of July, the Camborne Town Council wrote a letter to the leader, Councillor Bridget Smith. I won't read the whole thing. I'm sure uh, she has either shared it or not shared it, but I would just draw your attention to a few um, uh, mentions in paragraph two that the involvement of Camborne Town Council has been marginalised in the development of West Camborne. The planning applications are usually sent to them for information only rather than for consultation, and Camborne Town Council feels sidelined. They would hope that for Camborne Business Park, that the Town Council is fully involved and engaged in all the development plans. Quote, this would bolster local democracy, ensuring grassroots needs are being heard, and join the business park to the body of Tambourne, preventing it becoming a rejected appendage. So I feel that the amendment that has been uh, refused, and that is their right, is a shame because we do want to empower our local communities to be heard by us, the local planning um, authority and not have the local authority sideline the grassroots and the residents that we are meant to be providing for. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Betson. I don't think we have any further speakers on the amendment. Ah, yeah, no, exactly. No, no further speakers before the seconder. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Do go ahead. Councillor Hawkins. I'll be very brief. Thank you, Chair. Uh, to answer Councillor Richard uh, Dr. Williams, sorry, Councillor Dr. Richard Williams, to answer your question, that is exactly what this motion is about. It is asking the government to give us the excuse uh, me, uh, empowerment. Could Councillor, excuse me, Councillor Hawkins, could Councillor Heather Williams 
not interrupt another speaker. Yeah, well, could we just it, could provide consistency? I would. Can we ask Councillor Hawkins to complete what she wanted to say? Can you come back? Chair, I've said my bit. It's exactly what we're asking that the government gives communities the power that balances the power that developers have already. Simples. Can I suggest that we go to the vote? Can I just clarify, we're going to go to the vote on the amendment. In other words, whether we accept the amendment, which was up on the screen until recently. Okay. Well, yes, it would be helpful. Could we? Okay. Just one moment. Councillor Daunton, did you want to speak? No. <laughs> so, her, her microphone was on. Her microphone was on. Can we? <laughs> yes. Can we just uh, vote on this amendment? So the vote will be taken. If you vote to act, so he can immediately make ten pounds donation to the chairman's donation <laughs> to the chairman's charity. Thank you. Let's go to the vote on this. If you accept the amendment, press green. If you uh, register yourself as present, oh, I've lost my slide chair. If you uh, oppose the amendment, press the red button. And if you wish to abstain, press the yellow button. You have to register yourself first on the blue button and then indicate whether you wish to vote for, green, red against, or yellow abstain. Can I just check, has everybody voted? Good, hurrah. And there is the presentation. Uh, so the amendment, Paul, do I have to come to you? No, the amendment falls uh, because we have um, eight votes for the amendment, 16 votes against the amendment, and one abstention. So the amendment falls. So we go back to the substantive, and I'm going to go back to Councillor Cathcart because he wished to speak on the substantive. If you can, are you still with us? When it says a vote, I vote in opposition to your motion. Can we okay. put the. Excuse uh, me, I can't. You've only got two minutes left, so it's your excuse. Um. <laughs> okay. Sorry, just, just one moment, Councillor Cathcart. Can I just check? Did Councillor Bygot? vote to get registered. Good. Thank okay. you. Okay. So, Councillor Cathcart, would you like to speak briefly? Briefly. Yeah, I, I support quite a lot of this. My only problem is oh, the issue where it says we have a voice. Um, uh, you can have a voice and people won't listen to you. Um, I prefer a slightly stronger, um, well, considerably stronger clarification, something along the lines of uh, that local authorities will be able to continue to determine planning applications in a similar way to what they do at the moment. I know it's not, I know it's not on, in the government's intention to do that, but the problem is when we have the, uh, if, if our only comment is at local plan stage, a huge amount can change between the local plan and Chair, the can I move to, to the vote so that we can actually um, get this matter dealt with before we run out of time, please? Um, Councillor Cathcart, thank you for your comment. Does anybody else wish to speak? We have a few more minutes before we wish to go to the vote. Councillor Bygott. Thank you, Chairman. So um, I'm happy to support the, uh, the, the motion, um, the original substantive motion. Um, but I think um, a, a lot of this is speculation because um, although we've all written into uh, the consultation, we've made uh, a number of different points. We don't actually, there isn't a draft text for the legislation. We don't actually know that they're going to take away people's right to object to individual applications. I think it's very important that we send a strong signal to the government that they retain that right for, for the people uh, 
and that's why I believe we should support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bygot. Now, does anybody object if I go to the vote? Well, yes. Well, okay, let's go to the vote well. then. So, in this case, we are voting on the substantive yeah. motion. Okay. Sorry, just one moment. Does the um, Theresa want to have come up? Sorry, what do you I, I just want you. Okay, it, uh, actually, the time is up. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. The time is up. It was 17.32. I apologise. We haven't got time, I'm afraid, to take your summing up, Councillor Haynes. I do apologise. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry this is the point. Point of order. We can. Excuse me one moment, Councillor Williams. We can the Constitution take says just point one of order. moment, Councillor Williams. Will you just wait while I clarify? 15.12, point of order Would you please wait while I'm prepared to listen to you, but would you please listen to me? I'm saying that we are allowed to take the proposer's summing up after we run out of time. Councillor Heather Williams, what did you want to say? Point of order, Councillor Cathcart, I believe, was moving an amendment and then he was intercepted without opportunity. And then other speakers will have to speak. If he does still wish to do it, I'm just standing up his rights. If he still Councillor wishes Williams, to, I'll second it. Councillor Cathcart expressed a wish for a stronger wording, but he did not. That is right. I'm just wondering whether the proposal of the motion would, would consider strengthening uh, a bit in order We to can't do that at this stage, Councillor Cathcart, because we have run out of time. At 30 minutes, we can no longer take any debate or any further amendments. Right, All we can do after 1732 yes. yes. is to go back to the proposer of the motion and uh, invite her to sum up. Right, fair enough. Thank you. No, I'm sorry. Yes, we can vote. We can, t we just, it's, it, let me just take the wording. It is that we have a maximum of 30 minutes for each motion to be moved, seconded, and debated, after which we stop, and then the mover of the original motion shall have the right of reply before the motion or, amended or amendment is put to the vote. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm saying after 1732, we go back to the proposer for a summing up, and then we vote. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so, Councillor Haynes. Thank you, and I, I won't take that time. Can I just you. ask Councillor Nigel Cathcart to turn his microphone off, please? And I'm sorry, Councillor Cathcart, that we um, had to curtail that. Councillor Halins, do carry on with your summing up of the substantive motion. Yes, and I would just like to say, for those that have voiced support for the, you know, the overall spirit and principle of the substantive motion, to make sure that our voice is heard, and absolutely, I tried to word it that would, we don't know yet, so it's about would we move. That's the kind of wording that's in there. And to reassure Councillor Cathcart that actually in it, it's only talking about the, the community's voice, not the local authority, and the wording, that second wording. So I didn't include local authority there. You're absolutely right. What we're trying to express as well is local authorities' statutory rights as well. But, it's, but that's not here. What, what's in the second part of it is about the community's voice. That's where it's voice. It's not local authority voice, but statutory. No, Councillor no, Cathcart. No. Okay, and so therefore, in summing it up, I would just say I would hope I would I would like it. Excuse not me. Can I just ask everybody else in the room to be quiet while Councillor Kepper Halings is summing up? Thank you. And it shouldn't have been a conversation. I should have just explained it all how it came about. Sorry. Um, and so yeah, and I don't want it to turn into you know something which is another motion which may be about how the local authority performs. This is about our basic ability to continue providing that voice for local communities um, in terms of the way that the planning reforms are going. I hope you can support that, that motion there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Halings. Let us now go to the vote. So first of all, register yourself on the blue button, then indicate with the green if you wish to vote for, with the red if you wish to vote against, and with the yellow if you wish to abstain. Has everybody voted? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I, has, is everybody sure they, if you have, if your vote has been registered, your microphone should show only your vote, either red or green or whatever on the bottom. Oh, you're not voting at all. Okay. In which case, I think those numbers are right. Okay. 26 of us in the room, 25 have voted um, for, and there is one who is not voting at all. Thank you. So that motion is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I would just remind you that we are on item 15. Can somebody just tell me how many hours we've been going and whether we need to? Not yet. No? OK. Right, uh, so 15 is the chair's engagements as itemized on our agenda. I attended on the 9th of July the RAF Altenbury Wing Commander's Welcome Back reception. This was after pandemic at which the Wing Commander was actually saying goodbye because he was leaving uh, from his term of office. Uh, was it a nice reception? It's lovely. Good. <laughs> Was it nice to be out in the world again? It was very nice to see all the people from RAF Altenbury again. Thank you. And the USAF 501st Wing Support Command. Item 16, uh, I refer to our legal advisor. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, members will see within the report that there is a, um, an exempt report at agenda item uh, 17. Um, on reconsideration, uh, what we would propose is that uh, members do not need to go into closed session for the consideration of the report, which is at um, pages 89 to 94. However, if members did want to discuss the business case from page 95 onwards or ask any questions on the business case, we would request that members go into confidential session. Thank you. So, um, so I, I believe Councillor Batchelor is wishing to present this paper. Councillor Batchelor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, I'm presenting this as the um, lead member for housing and has, housing has uh, critical uh, responsibility for Ermine Street uh, business. So you've got the business plan before you. Um, Ermine Street is our market rental housing company. We review this annually and this is the current plan. It was presented to the Ermine Street Board on December the 2020 and agreed by Cabinet in March 2021. Ermine Street is now seen within the Council as a close partner to our housing department rather than just an investment vehicle. It concentrates on acquiring stock for rental within the investment area which is the Greater Cambridge commuting area, as identified in the CAMS and Peterborough Independent Economic Review, which does include Peterborough. Recently, they have acquired some houses in Camborne to be used as houses of multiple occupancy and are let by uh, Shire Homes, our other housing company is a let for temporary accommodation. This helps to reduce our need to use bed and breakfast accommodation in the council. The business plan review gives the company an opportunity to review the trading over the year, adjust the budgets and re-examine the assumptions. Uh, the bad debt provision and void loss assumptions have been changed because of the COVID pandemic, which has had an impact on rent arrears of void loss over the past year. Fortunately, in the short term, this will not have an adverse effect on the financial performance of the company. 
uh, and in fact, in recent months, that uh, situation has improved significantly. The current position today is that the company has acquired 470 properties and 29 in the pipeline, totaling 499 if all the pipeline progress is completion. This would leave one to be acquired during the remainder of 2021 to achieve the target of 500 properties, which was set back in 2015. Any future expansion in the form of additional housing beyond the 500 properties will be subject to further agreement from the council with an agreement about future loan terms and rates. The company's work will benefit the company at the council by around 3.43 million pounds in interest payment in this year. The council commissioned an options appraisal from Savills last year to consider future options once the target of 500 homes has been achieved. The report recommended that the company be allowed to expand to the original target of 500 homes, and then the council will take stock and decide on future investment. As well as buying homes to let, Ermin Street takes Ministry of Defence homes, typically on five-year leases, improves them if necessary, and rents them out. They currently have three lease arrangements in place, uh, with the Defence Infrastructure Organisation. These are at Waterbeach, Bassingbourne and Brampton. All leases have been reviewed and extended for another five years. And the number of units increased by six uh, in Waterbeach, five in Bassingbourne and 36 in Brampton, bringing the total uh, under the lease arrangements to 190 properties. The head of housing and head of Ermin Street meet monthly with myself and Councillor John Williams to discuss the acquisition progress, the future strategy, and the possibility of future developments within the council. This version of the business plan is to be, be received by full council as the sole shareholder in the company, and the recommendation is that council receives the plan for information. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Batchelor. Um, can I ask uh, if there is a seconder? Or thank you, Councillor Williams. Would you, would, you, would you like to wait to speak or would you like to speak now? I, I reserve my right to speak. Thank you, Councillor Williams. I understand Councillor Fain may wish to speak. Thank you, Chair. I don't wish to speak in the debate. Just as Council may recall, I was asked to take on direction of uh, Ermin Street. I'm not at this moment technically director, but I don't propose to take part in the debate or debate. Thank you, Councillor Fain. Uh, we have other requests to speak. Councillor Howell. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a couple of questions, if you don't mind, um, to uh, Councillor Batchelor. Uh, I, I'm glad to see the housing stock is expanding. I also remember that people were quite concerned that when Ermin Street housing was going to be purchasing houses in Peterborough, which they thought was a long way away. I noticed that we've gone slightly further than Peterborough in now in Leeds. Um, can I just ask, please, um, is that a one-off, or is that something that is going to be done in the future? And I, as I said at the time, let's see what happens when that, when that goes. Um, with regards to the houses and that we directly own, may I ask, please, and I appreciate you might not know the answer directly, how, we, how often and when do we check on these houses? Uh, and um, that. Also, um, I have know of a, I know of a, a New York Street house where the tenant, uh, where the tenant is, um, shall we say, disrupting a little bit of the other tenants nearby. Um, th there seems to be no real, the, I was told, method of, of bringing their concerns to Ermin Street Housing. Could I ask, please, if that could be clarified in the future, not now? And I think that's excellent news with regards to the leases, the 190 houses. That's absolutely superb and well done on that. Thank you, Councillor Howell. Um, 
Professor Batchelor, can I just remind you, I'm sure you're aware, that we need to respond in equally as neutral a term so that we don't get into the aspects which would need to be dealt with in confidential sessions. Professor Batchelor. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yes, the, we, we have, uh, or they uh, have properties in Nottingham, Leeds. Uh, these, these were brought about three years ago before we changed the policy to only uh, buy within um, um, our commuter dis distance. Um, the, the distance ones, and quite a few, a few of uh, our houses around are actually subcontracted to uh, agents to um, manage them. You know, certainly the ones in Nottingham and uh, Leeds, that we have that situation. Um, we do have quite a lot of properties in, in Peterborough, uh, but I wouldn't confuse those with the issues uh, about... Um, Putting homeless people in them, that, that's an issue for the housing department and it is not a part of Ermine Street's activities. Um, and apart from that, I'm glad he welcomes the money and you know, uh, to recognize that this is a, a multi party operation, really. So, you know, you, the Conservatives had the credit of actually setting this up obviously in the first place, and it's you know, one of the great successes here, I think. So, yeah, well done to us all. Thank you, Councillor. Chair, Chairman, I ask a few questions. I'm happy to have a written response later on, I apologize. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to you later on about them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Wright. Hi, Chairman. And through you, Chair, could I ask Councillor Batchelor, is he a director of Ermine Street? No, I was a director of Ermine Street when, when I was appointed to the housing post, uh, I uh, gave up that position. That's, that, that's quite helpful. And my question is a process one, really. Now, when Ermine Street's business case is presented to this council, it is a standalone company. It's not part of this council. And it should be the directors of Ermine Street presenting just what you've given to us. So my, you know, my question is, we don't cock it up. <laughs> Let's make sure we do the processes right. And it should be the director and your friend as directors of that company presenting this business case to us as the independent council to adjudicate on. Um, and, you know, how you wish to just iron that out for the future, I don't know, but uh, that would be my concern. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Um, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, and through you, Madam Chairman. Um, I was one of those, all those years ago, six years ago, that I was actually a little bit wary uh, of the route that we were going down. I'm sure Mark... Mark is remembering that we're all going drug and yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I think, you know, at least I've been proven wrong and that's okay because it's been proven um, that it's worked. However, um, you know, we ought to give thanks to actually then the conservative group who this idea came from um, and saw it through and resolved to have 500, which we are just about to, to get to. I am concerned, however, that we don't appear to be doing an awful lot um, for our own residents within this list. Um, and to hear and see that Leeds is down and Leicester, um, Nottingham, um, I would have been far happier um, if it had been South Camps Village, which, which seemingly, other than Capworth, um, isn't very much down here. So, you know, it's down... And thanks to the Conservative group that we've got this um, organisation that is, is working and has been successful. So thanks to them. I hope the rest of you agree, if you can bear to. 
And, um, you know, I would just like to say that we need, the problem, of course, for here is that the properties are overvalued. In South Cambridgeshire, bricks and mortar are overvalued. Um, when you look at the price, average price of the properties in Leeds against what we are doing, um, this is where this is where all this uh, development that we're doing is proving such a failure, because the prices aren't going down here; they're rising, and they're rising horrifically. Um, gosh, good news for the um, estate agents and the builders. Uh, but not very much good use for anybody that we represent who's in need of a house that they can actually afford and can't afford to buy and they're looking to rent. So I, I think we've got still quite a lot of work to do on this, um, but let's hope it moves in the debt right down. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Uh, Thank you, Chairman. And I'm one of many in this room who wasn't here when Ermin Street originally got set up. Um, and so I'm sure that uh, the words that have been said today are, are appreciated by those who may not be sat here in the chamber with us, but uh, were part of it. Um, and I'd say it's also a really good example where we can make investments in things that we know and understand and use skills from our officers currently and the services that we do and put it to good effect um, and uh, I think that's what's been done here and I would also chairman like to thank officers who looked again at the experience with press and public and and did taking on board the concerns that I and my group have raised so thank you very much for that officer thank you Councillor Williams uh, Councillor John Williams would you like to speak as seconder Yeah, I'd just like to um, basically add my uh, thanks to uh, the staff of Ermin Street um, for the way of, they have conducted themselves in very difficult circumstances over the past year, particularly through the pandemic. Um, they have managed to, um, they, you know, that we did have um, um, a number of um, bad debts, but actually through their hard work, uh, we are seeing that improving all the time um, since this report was uh, produced. And I think by focusing on an investment area, I think that's given Urban Street a focus and a purpose and enabled us to use them as part of our housing strategy for those living and working in South Cam, because although it does cover Peterborough, of course, we know from the travel to work area that there are people living in Peterborough who work in South Cam. So, so there is a connection there. Um, we did this because we were concerned about purchasing properties in Leeds and Nottingham, um, which, was, which was done under the previous um, you know, the guidelines by the previous uh, administration. But now that we have defined the area in which they are to invest, we are seeing them, as I say, providing homes for those who work here and also houses of multiple occupation for single people, which was, was not being done before. So, but I do thank everyone in Ermine Street for the efforts that they put in this past year in very difficult trading circumstances. Thank you very much, Councillor Williams. Uh, Councillor Batchelor, would you like to come back as proposer? <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Just to be brief, um, this is a, a good business um, which is contributing very significantly um, to our coffers here. Um, and, and we need to be thinking you know, carefully about where we go from here. Um, at the moment, we're just coming to our 500, um, we, so that, that decision will have to be taken in the next few months about uh, whether we continue or not. Um, I can't actually finish w w without the temptation of noting Councillor Roberts' uh, um, 
the statement that she had been proven wrong. In all the years that I've sat opposite <laughs> Councillor Roberts, this is the first time ever. <laughs> Anybody would like some minutes? Uh, right. Thank you. Good. Thank so, you. Uh, so, Chair, the, the world is changing, obviously. <laughs> Okay, thank thank you. you, Councillor Batchelor. Can I ask then, uh, it sounds as though, broadly speaking, um, people are in approval. We have noted that Councillor Fane is not going to vote. Can I just um, have an indication as to whether people are happy to take this by affirmation? Agreed. Agreed. Lovely. With the exception of Councillor Fane. Thank you. And so uh, at just three minutes to six, I will bring this meeting to a close. Thank you very much for those of you who have turned up. Thank you very much for those of you who have attended online. Thank you for respecting the COVID precautions that our democratic services officers have worked so hard to put in place to keep us safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Goodbye. Sorry, members, before we leave the room i just wanted to remind you that our next meeting is on the 23rd of september 2021